house today with Terry Ellis and literally in your house. I really, really appreciate you um, welcoming us into your property. Um, it's been amazing. You've been absolutely awesome. Same with your missus and your Rottweilers. <laughs> uh, super good. So, yeah, I really appreciate nice it, mate. Thank nice, you very nice. much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah, so we've we've had some uh, telephone calls and some text messages. Uh, I got I got one of your books for um for me for me kids. I absolutely love it. Um, take us back to the beginning, man. Uh well, you know, I was I was raised in Camden Town. Um, it was quite a, a poor community, and I spent my early childhood really just um breaking into warehouses and um, yeah, just getting up to all, all sorts of trouble. Um. My, 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 I first realised I was actually quite good at um, what I did because I, I remember my, a guy, one of my really good friends, phoned me up. He was only a young guy, and uh, he said he'd he'd, um, he'd found a warehouse in in Camden Town, at Kings Cross. So we went down and we we went in there about one o'clock in the morning, and uh, we had to abseil down down a rope. I was only a young kid. I was yeah. about I was about, about ten, eleven then, and uh, I remember him saying that he had uh, been looking at it. And we had to get through this skylight and, and put the rope down. And I went down about 60 foot. And uh, it was a real thin rope, and I was, you know, I was trying to get down there. And uh, I said, is it a lie? He said, no, no, it's, there's nothing in there. We can get it. It was a jean factory. So I got all the way down there, and as, as I hit the, hit the floor, the lance went off. Oh. <laughs> so I tried to pull myself up, but I just couldn't pull myself up. I never had no strength. You know, my strength had gone coming down. Yeah, and, yeah. And, I, and, and all I saw is him go, fuck. <laughs> and about two or three minutes later, I could hear the sirens. And I thought, oh, fuck me. But luckily for me, there was, a, there was an iron girder that goes all about the wall. So I, I saw, I saw I, I put my hand behind and then I could just get my hand in. I thought, oh, this is great. So I sort of, sort of monkey climbed all the way up to the top of the roof and then went across the girder and then pulled myself out. And then we went across the train lines. You know, with the old Bill chasing us. Oh, really? And uh, we 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 we'd already cut a hole in the fence across where we came in. Mm -hmm. So we run across, and we couldn't hardly see. But they, there was four or five of them chasing us across the tracks with uh, with, with uh, torches. So we could see the hole. So we went through the hole, and he went that way, my pal, and I went that way, and it was pitch black. So I ended up smashing into a graveyard because it was a graveyard we went into, and and there was a hole in the it was like a crypt. So I ended up pulling myself in there. <laughs> what inside inside the crib? Wow, it's old, it old Bill running everywhere, and I, I stayed there about ten minutes. But all I could all I could hear was like you know was noises and people running and everything. And then it calmed down, and I started you know if, you know as a young kid you get a bit scared you know you're in a, you're in this uh, yeah. graveyard. So I, I started trying to stay as long as I could, and I had this vision of the, the tomb thing fucking falling in on me, and, I, and no one knowing where I was. Yeah. So I so I quickly got out and legged it across the road and managed to get home and. Uh, I was pitching, I was covered in dirt and everything else, and you know after that I was we was out every night. You know, I, 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 he, we, you know, we'd done some some nice little moves uh, as a young kid. You know, trying to earn money in them days was quite hard, but we seemed to have this knack of uh, just earning money. You know, like you know, he phoned me one morning and said like, "There's a train that goes past Cam the King's Cross, yeah, and there's loads of cars on it." He says like it's, it's about two miles long. This this train tell. He said it goes really slow, so we we went and jumped on it, and we took like four or five black bags, and uh, we we opened every door and took the radios out. So we, as we were going along, we went, I think we went about six or seven miles, but we, we ended up in Acne, somewhere like that, and then we were chucking the, the bags down as we went along, and and then we tried to jump off the train because you know I can remember him falling over us over tit, and me smashing my head on, on one of them. Uh, uh, wooden uh, pylons as yeah. I came off it and then we walked back and we picked up the bags and we sold them for a couple hundred quid but it was like we were young kids we were full of beans and we thought this is it this is going to be our new life yeah. you know unfortunately uh, it got me into a lot of trouble and I ended up uh, being kicked out of my ass so yeah I smile when you're telling the story because yeah. like <clears throat> you can tell that you'd done it yeah. do you know what I mean like you can tell I could feel that like I could see myself there at that point of you guys just jumping off the train and yeah. just like having that score and just being like, "Wow, do you know?" It was it was like Eric, you know, kids have got PlayStations now, like, you know, you know, the, the adrenaline rush of going on the moving train and then opening the doors and taking you know, unscrewing the radios and then doing something and they actually know we were actually going to do it. There's there's a there's a sort of rush bravado and you know the thing that no one else was doing and we were the first ones to do it. Yeah, I think we we done, we we must have done it eight or nine times before they locked all the doors. I took the radios out, <laughs> but you know so that that scuppered that. And then uh, was it the rush that made you carry on doing um, like committing crimes or you know what we we came from a very poor family so the money that I used to get I used to, I used to give it to my mum. 
Mm-hmm. So we used to, you know, so we used to buy food. She was a, she was a professional shoplifter as well. So she your mum she fed us really well, yeah. Yeah. Um, so but she, we never went about food, but we would buy clothes and bits and pieces. So I really, you know, I never had really a really great concept of money apart from trying to help her out because she was a single mother. Yeah. My dad was a black cab driver, but he he was never there. Um, but yeah, I just I just found myself doing things and then really giving her money, and that was it. And. You know, I, I ended up in all sorts of trouble. You know, I was nicking cars. It, you know, fuck. I remember nicking a car, and, and I went down five hundred and turned the car over. So it's, it's, that's down in Cameron Town, it's a hill that goes round. And I, I think I was about twelve years old. So I could just about see over the fucking wheel, and uh, I turned it over. And uh, it, was, it was about half past one in the morning. Luckily, in them days, there was no cars on the roads, not a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And I turned it over, and I hit a, um, a parking meter. And uh, I was, I was, I was had a cut of bruises, but it wasn't wasn't that bad. But the meat was on the floor, you know, the head of it. Yeah. So I thought, fuck it, I took it. <laughs> I took the, I took the meat out, and I, and I went home. And, and when my brother went to school, and everyone went out, I went, I sneak, I sneak back in. I got a, a sledgehammer and I smashed it open. It was fucking, it was full of money. So I then spent the next few months with my pal going out at one o'clock in the morning, cutting all the heads off the parking meters in Camden Town. So we, so we just done that until we, until we got in trouble. So yeah, so we, you know, it was, it was always like sort of entrepreneurial, but it was all, you know, as we, as we created a revenue stream, you know, the old bill come down. It's like on, like you mm. know, on top of us, we got nicked. Um, you know, and I ended up going to um, to court a few times, and then, and then eventually they uh, they said enough is enough. You know. Um, and then I, I was I was uh, put in uh, a place called the uh, Seymour Place as a court, and uh, I can remember there was a, there was a, a, a prisoners' toilet. So you got men's and women's prisoners' toilets, and you got staff toilet. So as I walked along, I went into the staff toilet. You know, I knew what I was doing, but the guy was in the, in the in the room because I was only a young kid. He, he didn't think I was going to do anything. And as I opened the door, I could see the window was open about that much. In the in the prisoners' one, there's no there's bars on the windows. Yeah. So I thought, oh, that's a, that's a that's a that's a move. You know what I mean? So I went back in and and I was there for about an hour and I said, can I go to this hall again? And he, and he, and he was like, oh, go on in. And he let me out. And because they, they had guard because we were so young, they had to have someone watching us all the yeah. time. So there was a couple of other kids in the room. So I walked along the thing and as, as when he looked around, I, I shot in the, in the staff toilet and went in and I, I jumped down two floors and I thought, oh, fucking lovely. I'm away now, you know? And uh as I as I as I hit the floor, uh, I, I went to run through the gate, and the police van came through, oh. and and they and they smiled at me, and I just went like that, and you know, yeah, my confidence was was quite high from escaping, yeah, and that was an added bonus because I, I just waved back to them and I walked through the fucking gate, and I and I went home, you know, so, but unfortunately, you know, they, they they came looking for me, and I and I ain't going back, and they ended up making me a water call, so, uh, my mum, you know, took me to a home, and. Uh, she said that you got to go down there for a little while, and uh, and you'll be back. And that was it. I never went back. You know, really? so I was stuck there for yeah. for years through uh, the uh, the care system. I don't know why they call it a care system. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I've uh, I've had some dreadful yeah. stories that we filmed and we've gone back to revisited places yeah. as well with with people that has um, suffered from the care home system. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've not got you know. I, I haven't really got fond memories of the care system. I, I can remember uh, my mum and my social worker take me into this place and everyone being really nice. There was three or four guys and a couple of women. And um, as soon as they left, uh, you know, I, I said, I, I don't want to stay in the kitchen. Whack, bam, smack me straight in the face. Uh, then they all grabbed me on the floor. And How old was you at this time? I was 10 years, 11 years old. And this was a man punched you? Punched, it's the first time I've ever been hit by, by an adult. And he just whacked me. And I thought, fuck, and I went down. And they was all on top of me, but they were punching me in the in the back, saying, "Calm down." <laughs> yeah, you know, so you know, eventually I calmed down, and then I, I just sat there and I thought, "Fuck, you know what the fuck is what? You know what's happening? You know what's happening in my life? You know, I, I was a t- I was a fucker. There's no doubt about it, and I probably deserved to go away, but I didn't I didn't deserve that. However, it then made me, you know, really anti-authority. You know, I stayed there for about six months, and uh, I got expelled from school. You know, I was angry all the time, and then I ended up in, in a place called Stanford Ass. And I was only there like, you know, a couple of weeks, and I ended up stabbing someone. You know, the guy stabbed me in the back. Um, they, 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 as soon as I walked in, into the a literal dorm, stabbed you in the back, or yeah, just, stabbed me, yeah. stabbed me with an Afro cone, sharp an Afro cone. So what happened? I, I'd, I'd gone into this, this dormitory, 
and and there was there was yeah, mostly it was predominantly black guys, black kids, and was, I was a like token white guy in there. And about I think it was three of us, and and they said like you know, for you to sleep here, you've got to give us all your tuck. And I went, oh, fuck off. I was only young, and then they beat the shit out of me, just bat bashed me. Yeah. And then that night they came in and they they took they took the, the covers over my head and just like whacking me, and. Um, you know, so so we, we went through that for a few weeks, and then when I got my tuck, I thought, "Fuck you, I'm not giving you nothing." And then as soon as I went into my room, they came in again and started and waved me in again. So it was one of those scenarios where you know you wasn't going to win because there was too many of them. Yeah. Um, so over a few weeks, you know, I you know got you know I settled in a bit, and then I was I went swimming, and the 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 one guy who was who was sort of their their leader, a big black guy called Richard. Uh, and there's an Irish guy called Paddy, and there's, I can't remember the other black guy's name. So Richard weren't there, so we all went swimming, and the uh, next thing I know, I was swimming away, and so I felt a whack, and then I saw blood coming out my side. And then so I, I look around, and it's this, this twit. So I grabbed hold of him, and just started like, whacking him, and I grabbed the knife, and I just like stabbing him in the head. And, uh, and that felt really good. I felt, oh, I, you know, I finally uh, found something that I could, because I never used to be really... Um, I could right, fight because yeah. my dad was a boxer. He yeah. was a teacher's boxing. So, but this is the first time I ever realised that if I really wanted my own way, I could pick up anything. I fucking tore anything. So it was, it was, it was that moment I think that really changed me. I became really aggressive. Um, Which pushed you to your limits. And yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Other, I, no I, other option. I, I spent a month in the block there. You know, in the kids like kids CP, and and that month was really probably the best month I had in in, in there. Because I was on my own. own, yeah. So I like I like that isolation and being on my own. And then I had to go back to the wing, you know, the, the, the dormitory because there was there was three or four dormitories. And you got the young kids, older kids, and you know, and it was just like it was a proper, you know, proper nut ass. <laughs> and then I went back, but luckily for me, Richard had been moved, and his two cronies there were now, and they were doable. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you know, so I so I put it on them, you know, and 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 what I did, we stopped all the bullying. So from that day, there wasn't no bullying. You could see the change in the place, but it felt really good. I was only a young kid, and, and, and I had aligned myself with a few other guys there. One, one in particular was a good guy from South London. And uh, we sort of kept that sort of peace until, until I got moved. You have know? you spoke? Have you seen or spoke to the guy since, the one that uh, stabbed you? No, no. You know he was young kids. Yeah. You know, he was young kids. Do we know, when you're young... You know, it's all about impressing your peers, yeah. bravado. You know, I, you know, you, you know, you do things that you you wouldn't normally do when you're in the game. You know, you, yeah. you're just trying to show off to everyone else. And mo- most of the guy, most of the guys I've ever met in my life that carry knives, are really, you know, they, they can't fight. They're insecure, um, and they're scared of getting a whack on the jaw. Yeah. So what they do, they carry knives, and normally that that their attack is, is disproportionate to actually what's happening mm-hmm. because they're so scared of getting hit. So they'd rather stab you than have a they would have a fist fight. Yeah, um, and then they, they realise their mistake when they're doing a life sentence. But by that time, it's normally too late. This is some some of the things that we we um, are up against with my charity with yeah. knife crime, trying to prevent it. It's um, it's hard trying to get their head around that. Um, you know, there's more to life than just your uh, ego and your representation of what you portray yourself to be. Because, you know, when you're doing the right thing, you ain't curtain twitching, you ain't looking over your shoulder, you're not doing any of that. And these guys trying to grab their reputation are looking over their shoulder and living in fear on a daily basis. Do you know, it's, what's really funny is is that uh, these guys are so insecure. Yeah. And they've got so many insecurities, it's unbelievable. You know, but the but the minute they go in prison, they're they're surra- surrounded by some of the hardest guys in in our society. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, you know. You normally got fourteen guys on a on a spur, and uh, they all killed. Um, and depending on what sort of phone call they've had with their girlfriend or family, is how they come out every morning. Yeah, the you know, temperament of mind, yeah. And is you know, and on, on all win, there's enough violence to last you. But you know, when you're in that sort of environment every single day, you know, and you can't carry a knife. <laughs> you know, yeah. they, so they, they so. So where they were so scared to actually, you know, get take a punch, they're now putting themselves in an environment where they're going to be scared for fifteen or sixteen years. Because most most murders that I know were, were weak, you know, they, they, there was nothing, nothing in them. There was nothing to them, you know. And the odd, you know, and because as soon as they get in there, and they get a license, so they have to adhere to a whole set of rules. You know, they have to, they have, they can't get in any fights. Mm-hmm. They have to play the game. You know, this this normally kicks in about four or five years into their sentence. Yeah, I've, I've, I've so, been yeah, because the it, first yeah. the first four or five years is all bravado, fuck it, and all of a sudden they're seeing everyone go home. Is that why a lot of people around that time start finding um, religion? 
uh, Christianity and things like that because I've noticed that when when people are in jail, when they start to wake up and realise that what the fuck have I done? Nah. They kind of open their mind up, they open their heart up to uh, 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 superior. I think it's I think it's some sort of atonement. You know, I've I found lots of, of murderers, rapists, paedophiles. You know, they all sort of gravitate towards the church. Mm-hmm. You know, they think if, if they can be forgiven by God, and and the vicar, you know, they, it left some sort of effect on their parole. Um, unfortunately, because there's such a low uptake on people going to church in prison, that the, the, the vicar, you know, will welcome them with open arms. They make yeah. him the tea boy, altar boy, and everything fucking else, and they clean that church until there's no tomorrow. Unfortunately, the reality is none of them have changed. Yeah, none of them will change, and it's all it's all an act to get out of prison. And that's and that's how it is. You know, most prisons you'll go to, and you'll go. You know, who, uh, who who's in charge of the the church, and it'll be the lifers because simply they're all trying to play the game. We know it. The vicar knows it. The parole, the parole, the parole board knows it. But they still go through the same old bollocks. Yeah, there, yeah. there is some where it really does work. I mean, uh, a, f- a friend of mine, Shane Taylor, he was known as top six most violent mm. prisoners. Um, and he's truly changed his way from from an absolute. You speak to anyone that knows mm. Shane, and he's like an absolute lunatic. You know, like people. He he was looking to kill people on a daily, and now he's changed his life around. And you know, in 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 the name of of, of religion. And it, stuff. You know, what was, what was he in for? Um, like in attempted murder. murder, and attempted murder. Yeah, he just kept stabbing people. He stabbed yeah. a well-known person through through the through the head. Yeah. Um, he left with a handle in his hand. Um, Do you know what is? Is you know, I, I'm a born again Christian. You yeah. know, so you know, I know that you know the. For me, I found it in an open prison because in a normal prison, everyone goes to actually ch- you know talk, pass drugs, or yeah. just have a conversation with someone yeah. on a different landing. So when I actually became a Christian, I actually done it without all that. Um, and, yeah, and there's lots of guys that I've, I've met who, who have turned their lives around. You know, they get baptised and it's an opportunity for them to be reborn um, and start their life again. You know, some some fall and some succeed, you yeah. know. And, and you know, I'm, you know, I have, I think the four guys that I took my baptism with, I'm the only one out. They're really? all back in sight. So, yeah. you know, it's no, it's no indication because you're a Christian or you, you've found God that you're mm-hmm. going to change. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're still... 99.9%, you know, the same person, nothing's changed, Yeah. you know, and if you get put in a situation, you, you will revert back to type. You know, there has to be some real fundamental changes in your life and your thinking to actually change. Just because you find God doesn't make you a good person, it's yeah. going to change your life forever. Mm-hmm. There has to be some things that actually go along with that. You know, you know. Um, the want to change. Yeah, you know, you, you have to, first you have to want it, but you can also... You can also want it that bad that it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, lots of guys yeah. know. You know, I, I I was fortunate enough that when I got nicked, you know, when I got nicked for Verizon, um, I actually tried to escape. So I was in I was in a, a police van, and they drove me to Tottenham, and I had I think four old Bill in front of the car in front of me, a couple in the car, and we was in a van, and when we pulled up. I can remember my 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 uh, cuff being a bit loose, and as I was driving along, I took it off, and I thought, "Oh fuck me, that's cool. I I I might have some of this because I always used to have this really powerful voice in in my head. Yeah, there was one what I call my God voice, which is, "Don't do that. Be good. Be nice." And there yeah. was always this really powerful, the one that drove me for most of my life and kept me safe. If he stabs you, fucking stab him back. If he hits you, hit him first. Yeah, you know. So there's always it. So I could hear that voice saying, "Fuck me, the cuffs off." You know, go for it, man. There's only there's only fucking eight of them. <laughs> it's only eight old Bill. So so the, so the, as we pulled into St Anne's ID suite, the, the car went across up up and, and none of them got out. I thought that's, that's, they must be really secure that they think they've got me in this place, and that's it because the gate's shut. It was a fifteen foot wall, and uh, the other car p- uh, parked up. And they never got out. And then the guy in the van, he went, he got out and went and done the bus. That left two of them with me. And I was in, I was in two minds whether to do it because I could fight. I could. Probably, I'd have done both of them straight away anyway. Mm-hmm. But would I have been able to get out of the van? Because it was all caged in. Yeah. So one of them picked up a paper, started reading it behind me, and the other one opened the door like a fucking idiot. And uh, he pulled the door back and stepped down. So I thought, fuck it, bam! So I smashed him. I just put him on his ass. And I, as I ran around the corner towards the gates, a tall bill come through the gate. And I thought, fuck. So I ran. I jumped on top of a car, ran across the roof, jumped onto a van, pulled myself up. And then I jumped onto the wall. And I thought, oh, fucking, I could feel my 
yeah, my adrenaline yeah. was flying, man. I'm, I was actually laughing to myself. I'm out of here. I'm free. Then all of a sudden, someone grabbed hold of my legs. I felt a whack across my head. There was a whack in my back, and I was trying to hold on. I couldn't. The cuff stuck in the wall, so I couldn't pull myself up. Yeah. And I was trying to warm my mind, and all of a sudden, I just hit the floor. You know, fucking, you know, it was a fifteen foot drop. I hit the floor, and they were just weighing me in. And next thing, I was cuffed again, and and I was ceremoniously dragged into this gaff. And luckily, my my uh, solicitor came and said, "What's going on? What's going on?" I said, "You're not." Gonna. I said, "I just got out of the van." I said, "They just attacked me for no fucking reason." <laughs> so he said, "If I find any marks on my client, blah blah." So they said, "No, we're going to take him back to prison now." So they took me back. They said that I'd tried to escape. They put me in the suit, and and about three weeks later, they they sent a psychologist to see me. They said that I was a bit off key, so I said I don't want to see you. Fuck off! And then and then she came back again, and uh, so I started speaking to her. I had a big beard like yourself then, and I was in a suit, and I just you know I was really fucking angry. You know I was angry with everything. You know, and I started speaking, and and we started speaking about everything, and then. It, Got back, back being in care, and I think it was the first time I ever really sort of looked at my child as abnormal. Do you think it was easier yeah. to talk to her because she was a woman? Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. You know, we we sort of clicked straight away. Yeah, you know, we had a sort of, you know, she was a really, she was a good-looking girl, good-looking woman, and that that was the first. You know, it wasn't about change; it was about her. Uh, yeah, about, you know, I was surrounded by my four or five hundred men on the, on in, in Vanderville on the wing. Yeah, it was noisy, and it was about escapism. I had my single cell anyway. Because I was in the patches, because you, you you have to you, you don't get no clothes, you have got no furniture, nothing. You just got beds and cockroaches. That's it. Oh wow! And um, so so seeing her once every week was was a blessing. Mm. So the more we spoke, you know, I, I felt that release. I felt a little bit of the anger go, and then we we discussed going to Grendon Underwood, you know, um, and I and I, I was still I had that head on, and I can remember I was in the block in Pentonville, and there was loads of cockroaches in there. And I remember the governor coming around and him, I said, look, I can't live in these fucking conditions. It's all cockroaches. And you know what? You know, this is, um, this is, this is just, this is not really good. The living condition. And he went, well, don't tell anyone, you know, don't tell everyone because they'll all, they'll all want some. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, you fucking mug. You know, so I was done it for a few weeks uh, because of the, because of the escape as well. Yeah. And, and then uh, I got put on the landing. And I was on the landing for, for, I think, six or seven weeks. And I was seeing this bird and uh, the psychologist, forensic psychologist. And uh, it was going all right. And, all, and then my mate brought me some chicken. And, and the screw opened the door because by this time I got a sort of rapport with the guys and the screws and they yeah, were all yeah. right. So they left my door open for a little while and he could have a conversation with me. So he passed me some chickens. They left the door open. So what I did, I, I, you can pretend to lock the door and just push it too. So from the outside, it looks like it's locked. Yeah. So I just pushed it too. So I thought if I need to go out or someone needs to come in, they can come in. Anyways, so I, I, I pushed it too and everyone was getting banged away. And then I heard this, the governor's voice. You know, so I looked through, looked through the spy hole there, and I see him. He was there was about twenty visiting uh, inspectors to they do an, an audit every every year. You know about the conditions and everything mm-hmm. else. And while I was in my cell, that them few weeks because it was covered in cockroaches. I was I was lying in bed one night, and and the cockroach was because I had a bunk, I had one mattress, but I was in a bunk bed, and they, it came across and it fell on my face, and it fucking you know, I got up and I whacked my head on the on the bed. And there was this cockroaches everywhere. So it was like a, a Mexican standoff every night with these fucking things. I'd go and get a cup out of there and be cockroaches in there. And, it, you know, you, you know, you put up a lot of shit in prison. The noise, the mice, the rats, the shit, everything else. No one talks about this stuff, no. man. And the smell is unbelievable. Yeah, I can imagine. But And, and then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm you know, I, what I did, I put my, I put a HMP bag on the wall, a see-through plastic bag. And what I did, instead of killing them, because my mate said, if you kill them, they just leave hundreds of them in, your, in their wake. And they, and they hatch a few days later. So what I did, I started catching them and putting them in this thing. And I, I, I remember counting them. There was 120 exactly in this thing. And I had them on the thing. And I thought, well, next time I see that governor, I'm going to fucking give them to him. Well, I throw them on the Yeah. <laughs> so, so what happened is that my door was open. He had his back to me on the, on the pool table. And I thought, and there was loads of screws there. You know, they was all there doing their normal, they protect him. But because everyone was banged away, it was a bit lax. Yeah. And he was talking to all these women and everything else. And I thought, fucking, you know, that voice is coming to my my shoulder and I said go on go on just fucking open the door and do it and I and a part of me was saying no I'm doing I'm seeing a psychologist now everything's going all right and then all of a sudden I just thought fuck it open the door 
put them over his head and I threw them over all the people, all these women screaming. And all, and all of a sudden, there's all these old bit of screws on top of me, just fucking wagging, dragging me into the cell. And, you know, they chucked, they chucked me in my cell. It was just quite ironic. And then five minutes later, they come into my cell and grab me back out and took me down the block. Um, and, then, and then about four or five days later, they shipped me out to Wandsworth. Did you ever put up a fight back? Or You know what, you, you know... You hear about those of these guys that fight 10, 20 screws and yeah. fuck it, it don't happen. It's a myth. You know what I mean? You could put up a fight, but you're going to end up. So why did I just curled up? Yeah. And, then, and if, if they want to fight me one on one, I'll have it all day long. But you yeah. can't fight f three or four guys. It's impossible. It's, it's, a, it's a filmed. You know what I mean? Unless you are, you are superhuman strength and you, you are a fucking. How do you, you know? feel about that when you're watching these films and that? Like, and you see the Hollywood factor of of how they glorify, like, how you could be the man in jail when you just sit there and you, you sit there and think, like, because when I watch a tattoo program, when I'm tattooing, because yeah. that's what I do, I'm like, that's not true, that's not how it's done. Are you the same when you're watching I, I, the it, like, To me, it's, it's like a comedy script. You know, I see it and it just doesn't have any bearing on reality. Mm. You know, I see, I see all these people and they speak about all the shit that they do inside. It's, not, it's all bollocks. Yeah. You, know, I, 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 you know, you if you can imagine... I, I, you know, I, 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 I was in, in Swale side. I, you know, one, three incidents that, that really sort of take into what, what really happens in there. There was a, there was a, a mixed race guy, tall, about six foot three. He picked on this little uh, Thai guy. Um, and, but there were six or seven little Thai guys and they were, they were really nice, really nice guys. I used to have a drink with them and everything else. Yeah. And, uh, he picked on this, on this Thai guy and he hit him and everything else. And, and he, he was a bully. You know, but you know, I used to speak to him as well, but he was a nice guy to me, but he was really a bully at the same time. Yeah. And you know, so I can remember being up on the freeze landing, looking down, and he was having, uh, he was making, waiting for a phone call, and then he went in. And then I saw, I saw him the move, because what happens, you, you ask a screw on that landing to go and open your cell, you take him down to the end. That screw went, that screw went, and all of a sudden I see all the tires on all the corners. You know, there was all there. And then, and then he, as he came out at the, the, the phone box, they just, one of them grabbed him right out. One of them run up to him and they just stabbed him in the face. Bam, 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 bam. You know what I mean? And it was quick him. as well, isn't it? Oh, it was so quick. So it was bam, 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 bam. All the, all the blades all went and everyone banged up. It's gone. It was seconds. He was in a pool of blood. And then you, when you see that, you see all the congeal, because it ain't like normal blood. It's like really thick congealed blood on the floor. And, it's, and it stinks. It's, it's, you can smell it. It's, it's, it's horrible. And then, and then, and then you're, you're, you're cooking. You know, we used to have our own uh, kitchens there. And someone would come in and they they come in and they've got a, they put a, um, a pot on there and they fill it with oil. And you know that what's going to happen. Yeah. And all of a sudden your, your ear come back in and take it as if like, it's, it's like, it's like making beans on toast. Yeah. Pick it up and in two seconds like you're there. <laughs> the fucking scream. Yeah. And you know, if you've ever had a bit of oil on your, on your yeah. finger, yeah. you know how painful that is. So you can imagine it going in your face and all down the back. You know, and I, you know, I, I remember this guy getting done, and he, his hair just all peeled off, and he was screaming to the extent I had to put him out. You know, so you know, so you know, when you see it every day, it sort of it desensitizes you. You know, um, and also, you know, I don't think a lot of people really realize is that. In, I think in seventy nine and seventy four, they 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 brought this this policy out in England. It's called care in the community. And they let they shut down all the all the nut asses and all the all the hospitals for people with with, with mental problems. So and they they called it care in the community and they gave them their own places. Then no full world they couldn't cope on their own. So what yeah. they did every time they got in trouble they, they they put them in prison. So when you used to go in prison back back in the day when I was younger, you used to have like five or six people at the hatch queuing up for medication. If you go in prison now, you'll see all them people that should be in free and Barnet mental on homes. They're all in prison now. You know when it was like three or four cells. For these people now, there's there's like there's whole wings full of people with mental mm. disorders, schizophrenia, paranoid, everything, and they, they're so unpredictable. But they're actually mixed in with the general population now. So I can remember being there was a big black guy. He was fucking massive, and and I saw the screw go on on down the stairs, and he, he went after him and he stabbed him. Bam, bam, bam. You know he stabbed mean? the screw. Stabbed the screw. You know, for no reason whatsoever. You know, and I can remember. You know, I can just remember just watching. You know, from you know the, the 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 reaction on all the crew's faces when they came back, you know, because you know I was on the freeze and it happened on the two, so we could see it all. Yeah. So everyone was banged away, and we could you just saw the dismay of, of the screws. You know, and, and you know when you see it enough times and you see the reaction, because I used to hate screws, because okay. you know when I was younger, you know they used to give you an idea, but as you get a little bit older, 
And they've took that sort of mentality where all the screws are ex-soldiers. Yeah. You know, they didn't like us, we didn't like them. There was that fucking, there was that angst all the right, time. Right, who, was, yeah. who was the best, you know? But now you've got a different sort of mental mentality of screws inside. Most of them want to think they're doing something really good. Uh, they're up against it. There's, there's, uh, there's not enough of them. They're underpaid. There's not. There's nothing really in, that incentivizes any of the inmates to actually be good. Mm -hmm. So they're up against it. But you know, to sort to see their faces, uh, it sort of sort of changed me a little bit. I, 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 you know, I sort of kept seeing violence every single day. People getting stabbed. People getting hurt. And it, and it sort of it sort of, I don't know. It just it sort of shuts you down. You want to you want to get away from it. And then I got the opportunity to to do therapy. You know, so I got I got an application and. I knew Grendon was was one of these places that was pretty, you know, it, it was it was classed as, as monster mansions. It was full of of, of murderers, serial killers, rapists, paedophiles, everything. And everyone I spoke to said, "You don't want to go. You won't last five minutes." And then I I knew Razor Smith. Uh, he'd done it, and, and and Ray Bishop, and and they were classed as success stories. And I thought, well, they were both armed robbers. I'm, I was a robber. Yeah. And I thought, well, why should I let all these fucking monsters have, have, uh, do it and, and miss an opportunity to go and do it? So, so I, so I made, I, I filled an application and I didn't think I'd get it. And then a, a few months later, they, they, they accepted me. And, and then that was the start of my, my sort of the whole change of my mentality um, of um, becoming the person I'm now. Yeah, you yeah. Know, from who I was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I if I go back to who I used to be when I was when we done Verizon, you know, Verizon was uh, was one of the biggest telecommunication com uh, uh, companies in England. It's a data protection, uh, um, uh, but it's the size of like two two or three football pitches. You know, um, there's, yeah, it's a uh, it's a big job, isn't it? Yeah, that you did. It's is a uh, there's eleven security guards there, and um, you know we were doing we were doing really well doing what we were doing. And we was we was approached by by a consortium of, of people that said that there was there was something in there that they wanted, yeah. and they said it was it was I think it was like 120 motherboards that had the information on, so there was five million pounds worth of penny and chips, but the information on the motherboards was, was worth 100 just over 100 million if not more, so we were paid a sum of money to go in there and and go and do it. So we we spent I think four weeks on that one looking at it, you know. So we uh, you know we thought well, how, how do we do it? We can't ram it. I can't go through the roof, you know. It's, it's and it had panic buttons and everything. And it was just one of those jobs that that you really want to do you, inwardly. You know, you know, we we were really good at our game, but you know, there's always that job where you think, well, you know, we could really do something really good here, like the impossible yeah. one that you yeah. know that there's a way around it. Yeah. So we so we so we just looked at it, and I, you know, I spoke to my guys that I, I was working with, and they said, "Tell it's, it's fuck it. This is probably one we won't touch because you know it's fucking hard work." So I said, "Look, my mate's ex army." So we went down and said, he, he, he's really good. So we looked at it. We looked at it for a few weeks and, it, you know, we knew everyone who went in there, how many security guards were there, but we just could not find that in. You know, it was, just, it was an impossible win, you know, because they had panic buttons. So we thought, you know, we got, we got a cool time on this. We're going to walk away from this. But I was over, I was over West Hampstead. I went to go and see my mum. And uh, there was, all the traffic was all backed up and everything else. And... When, when, when the old Bill walked down the street, I said, what's going on? He said, oh, there's a guy on the roof. He said, uh, he's threatened to jump. And I thought, oh, fucking hell, that'd be a proper move. You know, so, so I went back to, I spoke to the mind, mind lot and said, no, I think I've got an in. You know, so we got the police uniforms. We had the dogs. We had the police van, police cars. So what I was going to do, I was just going to walk up to the front door. We was going to pull up one. So we, when we went down and we pulled up onto, onto, the, onto the front um, pulled the cars behind and then I just knocked on the door and said so we've had a report of someone up on the roof so with that they, they buzzed me in but it's, there's, there's, there's security doors so you go through the first one that has to be shut and then the next one's got to be shut and then it opens so you, you have to you have to shut each door so yeah. otherwise you can't get through so I was a little bit worried I was a lot worried about going going through and being, being stuck in there so but I had to get through two doors so I can let the other guys in so we've done it one at a time and uh, but because the the television or the CCTV camera room, there was there was three guys in there, and they had all panic buttons in there. We we now had to we 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 had gone past that point of no no return because we couldn't get out of there, so we had to keep going. Yeah. So if they, if they pressed that button, we were fucked. There, there's eleven eleven of them. There was five of us. Um. So so we so we made this ruse up saying that you know we've had a report of someone on the roof, um, but he was dressed as a security guard. Have any of you been up on the roof? 
And they said, none of us have been up on the roof. So I said, okay, then for my protection and my officer's protection, I'm going to cuff every single one of you until we find out who the person was up on the roof. And they said, that's all right, so then we pulled them away from the panic buttons. As soon as we'd done that, the pressure was off. Up until that point, you know, for three, three, three weeks, my, you, my, my pressure and, and, and my anxiety was up, you know. Yeah, um, you must have been like, this is actually working. Like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like, so I wanted yeah. to be like, yes, but you can't. You still have to still be like, well, it's, it's like going, you go through stages. So I knew like, we had to pull up there. You know, the, the first bit was actually pulling up on it. Cause I remember when we, when we first drove there, we, we, as we drove up there, the police car came behind us. And, and what an actual, an actual police, police car. car. Oh, wow. So we had the police van, the police car behind, we had a plain clothes uh, with a light on, yeah. And then we had our one was, was signed on the side. And, uh, Next thing, the fucking siren went on. So my mates in the back, we had we had all earpieces and radio. So what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Is it on top? And I said, just calm down, man. Anyway, the police car came round us and went up, but we had missed that point, so we had to go round again. So it took us six minutes. Well, we allowed ourselves an hour in this place, one hour, to do the job. So now we were six minutes late, so we had to make that six minutes up. You know? Yeah. So so we so we got in there. So we had to rush the, the entry, which went really well. We got everyone in there, and then we finally we finally said what we, we had to do to get them out of there. Then we had to pull the other three down in the lift, so we got on the radios, and we got the, the security guard to call them down, and there was two on the top floor. So what we did, we both went up in two separate lifts, me and my pal, and he went that way, and I went that way. I collared my guy and brought him down, and he collared his guy and brought him down. Um, so we had them all, we had them all uh, cuffed in, in um, the stairwell, and one of us stayed with the dogs, and then we let... Five or other guys that were with us, in, they were outside another van. They were they're the ones that come in. And they they got electric drills. They can drill all the mother balls out. And then we, we had we had washing bags with with special bags that you can put the mother balls in, so the stack doesn't mess them all up. Yeah. So so we then spent an hour in there, you know. And and then while we was in there, there's uh these two uh, maintenance guys came and then four cleaners, so we had to wrap all them up as well. But the two mate, we wrote we had, we we run out of cuffs. And then all of a sudden, these two guys came in, and my mate was on reception. He says, oh, fuck, you know, there's, uh, there's two guys. So just let them in. This was before we'd done anything. This is like we was only in there a few minutes. And uh, so, he, so he said, just let them in, and then we'll see what happens. If they come to our floor, because we was on the first floor, and then we'll, we'll, I'll just I'll wrap them up. I'll just do whatever it takes. We'll fucking do it. Anyway, luckily, they went to the, to the third floor, and they, what we said, I said, just keep them on, on, on eyeball. And then as we went into the big motherboard room, um, there's a live camera on there, so we knew this anyway. There's a live feed from a, from a security company. So what we did, we, you can't just cut a bit of fucking. What it's not like it is in the films. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a system downstairs. You have to take it out and disconnect it all, and it all shuts down. So we found out where it was, and then we shut it down. So this is a private security van. So as soon as that, as soon as anything happens, they phone the old bill saying it's gone. So there was, there was security there, plus there was an independent security company. So I went, I was on the phone. So the, the, the two seconds after it went down, the, the fucking phone went. I said, hello, Verizon Security. Uh, how, can I, how can I help you? He said, all our cameras have gone down. Our cameras have gone down to the mainframe computer, blah, blah. So I just said, we've had a mainframe uh, surge in the computer system. It's all gone down at the moment. Our technicians are in there. should be up in 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, he said, oh, oh. And they said, let's know. I said, no problem. Bye-bye. Boff. And I said, the guys go. And then they, they went in. And then, uh, then you know, we let the, the, carry, the carriers in. And it was just like an hour then of, uh, of my adrenaline was like pumping my juices in my mouth. I kept think, I kept thinking, I wonder if he's, is he, is he bit? Is he, is he telling me the truth? Has he phoned the old bill? Yeah. Has anything gone wrong? Has are there any of these other cameras in the building on us now? Are they got, uh, can they access them? So it was just trying to stay calm because I was orchestrating it. Yeah. So, you know, I was saying, go, you know, go, everyone's just calm down. And we was on radios anyway. And then they said, right, we're ready. So we went and got, you know, we put all the bags out. There was 20 bags. That's why they called us the Real Ocean's Eleven Gang, because we all had two bags each. I, I, I had three. My mate had three because of the guy holding the dog, he's never been caught. Uh, There's only two of us ever been caught on this. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So, so that's why I won't mention the names. Um, so, <laughs> so we just all walked out of there. And we, we walked him straight into the van, and we locked up. We left there at 10 o'clock, bang on. That was our, that was our scheduled time. It took us exactly. Four minutes to get to Kentish Town, uh, up the road. And as we got, as we pulled parallel with, with Holmes Road Police Station, all the vans came out. Oh, good, towards so, the job. Yeah. yeah. So we thought they were coming. They, they thought we were. They were. They were coming for us. So we we pulled up, 
and and they pulled in front of us and there's four or five cars and vans and then there's another entrance to Holmes Road in the back. They was all coming out and they were going that. They got in there at six minutes past the old bill. Cool. You know, so if you didn't make that time, up, we never got out of that. Yeah, we were, we were, we you know so so they they gone that way and then there we had that sort of sigh of relief and then and then that we sort of carried on. We got my, my mate got out with a dog and took it back to the guy that owned it. And we went and, and uh, we dumped the vans, car, burnt them out, and then we got rid of all the stuff. We we had, we had a, a, a place where we left them overnight, and then we arranged to meet to to, to hand everything over the next day. So and that was it. Um, and then I got I got Nick a, a year later for that. How did they manage to um, capture two of you, like <laughs> from one other? How, what was it a year later that they managed to stumble uh, across? Yeah, it was it was, it was really a, an innocuous. Uh, a innocuous uh, a bit of work. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, we're doing a bit of work. They nicked a two hundred thousand pound out of the safe, and, and the police turned up. Um, Just randomly, yeah, yeah. The police turned up, and and they they got one of the old bill got what what smashed. One of them got thrown over a wall. But one of my one of my pals got nicked. Everyone else got away, and uh, so they'd done known associates, and I'm, I was really good friends with him. So they. They showed my picture to some security guards, and, and they said, "No, that's, that's the guy. That's the fucking guy that done all the talking." So next thing I knew, I was, I was, uh, I, 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 I found out that he got, he'd been nicked, um, and then because um, I was actually on the canal boat, I think I was at the time, um, and then uh, and every door that I, every everywhere I knew, just all the doors are going in. So I was, I was, I was actually in London, and not too far from here, and I woke up about half five in the morning, I think it was. And I'm always up early because I'm, like, like, I'm conditioned that way to be up early. Yeah. And I, um, I'd, have, I'd, have, I'd have about 30,000 quid in the rucksack. Uh, and I had my passport in the other room, bank book and everything else. And, and, and I was going to have a fag on the, on the, on the, on the, 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 um, the balcony. And uh, as I looked over, a bird and the guy walked past. And I thought, That's fucking, you know, they, looked, they looked really iffy. You know, yeah. They were looking up. And I quickly just took, went back. So I thought, you know what? I'm, you know, I don't like this, so I, I ran through, left my bank book, I had my keys, everything, yeah. But I got the rucksack, I had 30 quid in it. Jumped up on the, on the roof and I ran along, went down this fire escape and, and dropped to the floor. And as I came walking around the corner, I see them all going in there. There was, there was, there was I don't know, about 20 of them, old Bill, all going to the, into the flat where I was living, you know, with, with the girl. I never even told her that I left. You know, I was, it, was that, it was that quick. Yeah. You know, as soon as I saw them, I thought, don't, don't look right. And I ran through, bam, jumped up, and I was gone. And I never, never even gave her the up, heads up. I, I felt pretty bad about it. But you know, if I'd have warned her, you know, she, you know, they'd have been, they'd have dispersed downstairs. Yeah. They thought they had the the, the surprise, and they thought if they come up and don't, don't do nothing, they they left everyone there. They never even surrounded the place, so it was pretty. So I had an opportunity to get out of there. And I, I spent the next year on on the run, you know, until I got nicked. Um, and I, I can remember, um, you know, I used to go to the gym every day. You know, so I lost a lot. Of, you know, I was training every single day. You know, I was really healthy, and I, you know, I was sort of, you know, doing little bits of graft, bits and pieces, and you know, nick a few quid here and there. And uh, I, I, and I just um, arranged for my passport because I was going to uh, Thailand, and I arranged my passport, picked it up. No, I'd, I'd, I'd sent all the all the picture down there, everything else, and I was supposed to pick my passport up the day before. And the guy said, "No, I've, I'm, I haven't got it. I have to do it tomorrow." But I'd already booked my my ticket. So I said, all right, what I do, I meet you at the airport. I meet you at Lewin Airport. And I said, he said, all right, no problem. Anyway, so I got rid of everything, every old bit of clothes I had, everything. I bought a load of new stuff. And I was sitting in the ass, and I thought, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go and get something to eat. And as I, I walked around the corner, I was just about to walk across the road. And next thing, I see a car come across the pavement onto the grass, and there was a brick wall here. He came, and I thought, what the fuck? And as I looked around, another one came. So I sort of jumped up, and they sort of, they, they were trying to pincer me, and I'd break my fucking yeah. legs. So I jumped up, and next thing, a van came, pulled up the side me, and they all just come out, and they were just fucking weighing me in. You know, so next thing, I was on the floor, and I, you know, I was done the normal thing. You've obviously got the wrong guy. You know what I mean? What the fuck is going on? We know, is it Terry Ellis, Terry Ellis, Terry Ellis? And my name is Eddie. My name's Eddie Wilcock, blah, blah. No, Eddie O'Brien it was. My name's because I had a, I had a driving license with Eddie O'Brien. I said, look, fucking chuck my ID and blah, blah. So we know she, you fucking idiot. You know what I mean? So, so once, I, once I realized I was fucked, it was actually quite a relief. You know that, you know what? I'd probably do five or six years in prison and it'd be over. I'd, yeah. I'd serve my debt. Because being on the run is really, it's, it's not all, all, uh, 
all fun and glamour. Yeah. You know, me, if I'd have gone to Thailand, I'd probably had a, had a ball. I had a great time with my mate. Had a, my mate had a couple of bars out there, so I'd arranged to, to work over there and, and earn some money and do whatever. But the reality was, you know, it was a shit life. I, I, I couldn't see my kids. I was always looking over my shoulder. And, you know, I always knew that it was going to happen. So when it did, I was actually really calm. You know, it was, it was, it was like... I can remember driving back to London from from Dunstable, coming through there, and and I was on the motorway, and it was it was about six or seven o'clock in the evening, and all the lights and everything, and you know you know that you ain't gonna see daylight for a while, you know you just think fucking hell man, if only, if only I never got up today, if only I never done this, if only I never done that fucking job, yeah, and I, and all of a sudden I got the Kentish Town Police Station, which is my manor or my area, and as I walked in there, I saw my picture on the wall. You know, and and then as I walked through the doors, all there was all that. They all gave me a round of applause, not me. They give the, the old Bill a round yeah. of applause, and then uh, that was it. I spent three days in there. What did you think when you got in and they started clapping uh, in that lot? Do you know what? I just I just thought, you know what? Yeah, but they don't. You know, it's, it's I, I I never ever just like the old Bill. Yeah. You know, I never I never had this like you see all these fucking idiots and I hate the old Bill and they're scamming. Yeah. You know what? We do our job sometimes very badly yeah but you know we always sort of uh we had the sort of mutual respect with me and the old bill you know they do their job i do my job and as criminals we have a sense of fair play uh like you know if the old bill try to fit us up uh, we, we we start screaming from the rooftop but we take liberties all our life yeah we don't yeah. we bend the rules we break every fucking rule but we when we get nicked we expect fair play but yeah but you know they was really good you know they never they never done anything to me they never you know they just they offered me a deal i refused they offered me uh you know i could walk out of there if i gave them the motherboards and all my crew and i and i and i said fuck off um then i and then i you know and then i had to escape attempt uh, a few days later mm -hmm. and then i i went to wandsworth and then when i was in wandsworth i was i was it was about half past one because we had bang up over over dinner and I had the screws come to my door and I, you know, so I said, I haven't got a visit. Oh, fuck all. What's, what's the problem? I said, come with us. <laughs> I said, so what's, 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 I said, I haven't got a visit. I haven't got a legal. I haven't got nothing. They come with us. I said, I'm not going to tell you again. I said, I haven't got no, I haven't got a fucking visit. So you, you've got a visit. So I went down. So I followed him down and we went into, there's a special bit inside ones of where you have interview rooms. I said, if it's the old bill, I'm not speaking to anyone. So they kept me in this. They kept me in this room for about forty minutes, and I, I saw these two guys, and they 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 wasn't old Bill. They looked they looked, they looked proper serious. They looked they, first of all, I thought they were military, uh, and then they came in, and they just said, "Look," I said, "Who are you?" I said, "Don't worry about who the fuck we are." Oh really? You know? Yeah, don't worry about who the fuck we are. Just shut the fuck up. Um, what we want, we want all the fucking motherboards. We want all the information, and we want it fucking now. But you're, you're, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna get this and blah blah blah. And they, said, they, said, they offered me like a million years in prison, and and they told me exactly what they would do to me and uh, fitting me up and everything else. So I went, you know what? I'm not gonna say fuck all. Who are you? So we spent a bit of time going back and forth. And then they left. Um, then the governor came in, the security governor, made a cup of coffee, and said, "Let's tell you, you know what? You might as well talk to these people. You're nicked." You know, you're going to go away for years, blah, blah, blah. You might as well talk. It'd be a bit more bearable, blah, blah. I said, look, I'm not talking to fucking no one. Anyway, they came back in. I said, listen, I'm going back to my cell, and that's it. Anyway, I, I, I went, after they left, I went to the, the screw and said, I really want the, the log. I want to find out the log and who these guys are. Because, you know, he said, look, they were never here, tell. They were never here. And then that's when we realised they were in my five. Oh. So, so... I spent a few months, I spent about nine months in there. Then I went on a Newton hearing. And, you know, I should have got 10 years. I should have, you know, and then I went on a Newton hearing. And uh, I went in front of the judge and said I was going to go guilty. And what sort of, if I go guilty, what sort of sentence? Because they, you know, they, even though they had pictures and everything of me, it was, it was, it was still, yeah, still a 50 50 chance, you know what I mean? Because we all had caps on and everything else. And they never had no fingerprints, no DNA, or nothing. They just had some, some Scotland Yard uh, Kanga saying that that was me. So, you know, so I could have half fought it. And, uh, but, you know, so I thought I'd have a Newton see what happens if I go guilty. And then he came back and said, well, you know, if you go guilty, I'm going to give you 23 years. So I went, fuck that. Fuck him. I fucking, I'm not going to go guilty. So I said, bollocks to this. I'm going not guilty. Anyway, so my, my solicitor said, look, you know what? You've, you've really got to go. You've really got to do this because you're going to get fucked. So I went back to the cell 
and the same guy came down, uh, the MI5 guy, and he because I, I, there was a knock. I thought it was my my uh, my solicitor, and this guy knocked on the thing, and, and he said, "Oh, that's a bit that's a bit rough. He's a bit rough on you today, tell." You know what I mean? Trying to be friendly. I thought, oh, not you, you can't. He said, you can walk out of here. You could be at home with your kids by Christmas. He said, this could be a fucking distant memory, blah, blah, blah. I said, you know what? Nah. And that was it. He went, you're going to be sorry. You know what I mean? Anyway, so I went back and, and my mate went up first. He, you know, he got sentenced. He got, I think he got 11 or something years. He got something for the robbery and he got, you know, a few concurrence of other things we've done. And I went up there, and, and he gave me nine years. I thought, oh, wicked! I've had a right result. And then he gave me a, he gave me another sentence. I made it get sick, so I couldn't appeal it. So he gave me two sentences. So it meant just under seventeen years. Wow. Yeah. So, so he, he said that what happens? I got, I, I got less than my pal. So, but he, he got eleven. So he had to do half. I got, I got nine. And then they added it, so I had to do that sentence, and then they added a six, seven in front of it as well. Wow. So I had to start do two sentences, which it topped me up to you know, 17 years. So yeah, I was, a bit, I was a bit pissed off. I was really angry. Um, but, you know, knowing what was in front of me, I, you know, I realized I really, I, I've, you know, I've had a really shit fucking life. You know, crime, crime had been good as far as destroying my family, destroying me. Um, you know, I was I was taking lots of drugs, cocaine. I was drinking every night. I slept around. You know, I, you know, everything I said I wouldn't do or wouldn't be to my kids. I was. I was a, I was a scumbag. Yeah, there seems to be a pattern when it comes to trying to live the life of um, a uh, a criminal. Some some criminals don't like the word gangster. How do you feel on that? Uh, you know what? You know what? It's, it's it's that's a media talking gangster bollocks. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's no such thing. We we we're, we're workers. Work, you know, we had a job to do, and that was what we were good at. You know, yeah. but there comes that all comes with a provider of life, like drink, drugs, partying, women, uh, all things that you end up thinking, why did I fucking do all of that for? I, you know, what is I I spent my whole life in the criminal fraternity, so I never knew any different. You know, I, I think when I was 21. I went to I went to Spain, you know, and I started doing puff, the mecca of all criminals. You know, yeah, yeah. close to the soul. So I, I, you know, I, we were sort of the nouveau riche at then times. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we were young guys. And we, had, we had a few quid, so I was buying like two or three hundred k at a time, and and, that, and I remember driving it from from Marbella up to Valencia, and thinking I was this, you know, we because we used to have three of us, you know, three of us doing. So we had one front driver, one back driver, me in the middle. And we'd load up, and the, the back driver would have London plates, my other pal would have uh, Madrid plates, and I'd have Manica plates or whatever, you know, it would depend on wherever we were going. Yeah. And we'd all have phones, but we'd all have, you know, you had to be a certain amount of kilometres because of the turn-offs, because they used to do rolling roadblocks all the time. So, you know, I'd, I'd done that for a, for a few years, you know, just running gear up, and I thought I was on a little bit of a suicide mission, I didn't give a fuck. Yeah. And I think that's why I was so good, because I never had that. I never had that fear because prison, because I was in the care system and I was in boarding schools and, you know, prison really was a sanctuary. You know, it was something that never really bothered me. It was just somewhere I, I really basically called home, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, it was somewhere I could have my own room and I could, I could shut myself away from the world. You know, so I was on this suicide. I was split up from my wife and, and, and I was doing the runs and, and, you know, I was doing it for a while, and, we, and I was sleeping around, um, you know, fucking everything. I was doing some mad, mad shit. And, and then one, one night, one, my, my mate went off a cliff. He was driving back, and he went off a cliff, you know, and he died. Were you fall asleep or something, or just going too fast? Yeah, pretty too fast, I think it was. You know, when I say a mate, you know, we, you, you, you don't really have no mates in this game. Associates. You have associates. So he was a, he was a guy that I worked with quite a few times, but... I knew, I knew his girlfriend, I knew him to go out and have a couple of meals with a drink, but I never really knew him. But he was a nice, really nice guy, and I was really shocked when he died. So I had to get out of Dodge, so I came out to England. And then I, I, I packed that in, and then I ended up in, uh, I went to Amsterdam for a few years. You know, I was working over in Amsterdam, and just doing coke, you know, bits and pieces, ease and everything, sending them back bits and pieces. And and I was, you know, if, if you've ever been to Amsterdam, it's the red light district. Yeah. You know, for a guy from London, it was like, it was like all my dreams, man. It's like, yeah. wow. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, I was back and forth. And then I met some, I met a couple of guys that, when they were part of the Mafia and the Triads. And, and uh, my mate had just been nicked out in Spain. 
and where he was, he was basically their captive. You know, so he was like, he was in prison during a couple of years and he had met these guys and they'd give me, you know, they got in contact with me and I'd arranged to meet him in King's Cross. And so we arranged to, um, we, we had something to eat with him, one, one of the guys. Um, and he said, I've got some, some weed. And I'm up until that, part, that point, I've never even done a fucking kilo of weed. I've done path and that and coke and everything. And he said, I've, I've got some weed that you can, you can have and we're, uh, your friend is in there with, with our friends and he recommends you and blah, blah, blah. He was, he was Dutch. He had a, I remember he had a, a hundred gram diamond bezel watch on. Really? He's immaculate. He, you know, he's, well, he's a wealthy boy. And I was with my pal. He's well educated. He's got a lot of money, my mate. Um, and we we laid it we laid it on a fig in this restaurant because it belonged to my pal. It was a wine bar, and uh, so we had the projection of, of wealth. We had the projection that we knew what he was doing, and then uh, we sat down. You know, we didn't have a fucking clue what he wanted. And he said, "I've got I've got um, I've got a shipment of, of weed that we want you to sell for us." So he said, well, "No problem." So what do you got? He said, "We got seven ton." <laughs> so. So I was sitting and my mate just went, just went boff, didn't it? I said, no, no problem, we can do that. It's not a problem. Just like that. So uh, yeah, I said, uh, I said uh, you know, it's going to take us a month or so. And uh, my mate was just kicking me under the table. So we had something to eat. And uh, he said, we had the seven ton and then we have the other the other bits and the four containers. So it worked out at 28 ton it was. So I'm, I'm sitting there and my and you know, I'm pretty one of these guys that take, oh, I'm always a gambler because I think that's, that's the nature of my, my personality. If you're going to do it, you might as well you do, as well do it. Yeah. So we'd never done anything like that. And he was, he was, he was frothing at the mouth, my pal, but he was very calm. He was a lot older than me. He was in his fifties. I was only young. I was at 35, but I was full of, full of, uh, full of myself. And, uh, you know, so the next day, you know, we went home that night. He said, tell you, you're going to get fucking killed. You are definitely going to get us killed if you fuck up this. These guys are people you can't fuck with. So I said, look, just, just chill, man. Just fucking let's see what we can do. So I went and spoke to a few of my pals in Acne. Uh, black guys I know really well, grew up with them. And, and when I said to them what we had, you know, I said, how much can you do? One of them said, I'll do a couple of ton every week for you. I thought, oh, fuck me, lovely. So then I went to my other pal. He said, I'll do the whole lot. I said, I'll do the old seven ton. He said, don't give it to no one else. I'll have it done for you in a month. So I said, I've already gone to him. I said, he's going to do half. So I do, I do half each and I'll give you the rest when he comes in. So these two guys I had really just made me an absolute fortune. Wow. You know, we nicked, we nicked you know, a few million quid out of that. So, but, you know, so they dropped it down. I sold it. I gave it to them. We done the book work. We gave it all back. And then, uh, you know, that went really well. And then, uh, then I had the, uh, you know, it was just going really well. So fucking well. You know, and then the old bills on me, they was flying around me, they was watching me, they were going down my bins. So I just thought we just sort of called it, called it a day. You know, I mean, we just sort of like, this, this is sit back and call it a day. So then I went to Amsterdam and, uh, you know, after, uh, uh, I think about a year of being looked at. So I couldn't earn fucking nothing. You know, as a criminal, you've got to earn every single day. You've got to pay, yeah. your, you've got to pay your mortgage, like the cut of verses. And you can't just turn off. You've got to go out to work. So I went to Amsterdam and, um, so I did a bit of working with some Colombian people I know over there and over here. And um, I was working with a Yugoslavian guy uh, called Sergio and another guy called George, big uh, Serb as well. And uh, we was doing really well. We were smashing it. You know, we was like, you know, I was doing my thing. I could go and see them. I trusted them. I loved these guys, really. We used to go out, you know, we used to have some really good times. Yeah. And uh, one night I came back and they, one of them had been killed. Sergio had been shot in the head. And the other one, George, had been crippled. Um, they went on the meet and some Albanians had, had shot them and nicked, nicked, nicked some money off them and fucked off. But, and then, you know, for me, it was a massive shock because, you know, we was working in the dam and, you know, it wasn't, you know, there was shit happening out there. It was a vicious place. It was a, it was a seedy, shitty uh, and dangerous place to live. But, you know, and then all of a sudden, I had, you know, one of my mates had been crippled and one of my pals been killed. So I, I thought, fuck this, I'm, I've got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. You know, um, did you feel like that was going to come on top for you as well? You know, it was. Is I knew Sergio was a really nice guy. He was an ex military guy, a really nice guy. You know, you know, we've done some lots of stuff over the years, and and he was a really lovely guy, really good person. He had a couple of kids and all that, but I only met him. You know, we had, we had phones. You know, we changed our phone all the time, but we we always had a way of getting our numbers. So we yeah. always met on the phones, and we met in Amsterdam, in London, everywhere else. But I never actually knew where they lived because that's what, they don't know where I live. I don't know yeah, where they yeah. live because that's something you never do. 
And then, and then, cause then, and George, he just disappeared because he got, he got shot in the back and he, he, you know, he was crippled. But I couldn't even go, I uh, couldn't go to the funeral. I couldn't even go and visit him because I didn't even know where they were. Yeah. Because once the yeah. phones went down, that was it. My phones went off. And, and I, and I headed back towards, uh, Blighty, uh, thinking that that's it. You know, I stayed over for a few weeks. And I think, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go, you know, because they, they had really good contacts and, and really, you know, without them, really, I, I was fucked. You know what I mean? They, you know, they were my lifeline. Yeah. They knew everyone. And I ended up, I ended up going to, I, I went down to Ostend and, and I, I got a train down to Ostend and my mate phoned me. So I got a warehouse up in Ostend. He said, come and come meet me. So I said, all right, and no problem. He said, what are you doing? I said, I said, I'm just going to go back to England. I've had enough. I've had enough of all these bollocks. He said, you know, I've got a lovely little movie, here, some cigarettes. He said, we can get them all the way down to Germany, Luxembourg and all that. And I thought, as you do, I thought, um, oh, fucking hell, all right, let me, let me see what I can do. So I phoned a few of my people in London. I know people in Birmingham, Manchester, everywhere. And, and I said, like, I can probably get probably X amount of, of cartons for you every week. Do you want them? And they went, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next thing I knew, I was shipping over fucking lorry loads of uh, <laughs> um, uh, cigarettes every week. So what we did, we used to get them down from Germany or Luxembourg, and they come in cartons. So they got the name of the you know the companies and shit. So I, my job was to take them out of there, and I'd put them on the lorry. Then I'd then he would go. He would go down to Cali. I would I would I would go on the ferry. Then I would go back to to uh, uh, Essex, and and I would go and arrange for the lorry to go into a farm, get unloaded, and then once the lorry went, I'd then arrange for all the vans and everything to go and pick up all the stuff. So I've done that for a, for a, for a few years. Oh, wow. Uh, and, you know, as like everything, it was going like clockwork. And uh, one day I was, I was uh, just, I'd met my pal. Um, we were just driving up, I think it was a place called Cuffley it was. There's a little farm we had. And uh, he was in the car. So what, what he did, he took my car and I took the van. Yeah, because yeah. he couldn't drive it. Yeah. Anyway, so he went and, as, as, and I got caught behind a load of traffic. And I see him put him in my car. And as they pulled into the farm, a fucking um, a Land Rover came flying across the road, smashed through the fucking gates. Another one come through a hedge. And next thing, as I drove past, they all had guns on him with all these fucking red dots. Red dots him yeah. and him and his pal. There was two of them in the car. In the car. Did they think it was you in the car? They thought it was me. They thought because I was over there, it was cocaine, it was this. But they thought they had me, you know. So, so I just I just drove on and I. Fuck, fuck, fucking hell, man, what's going on? So I left it for a couple of weeks and then I phoned my boys up and I said, what's going on? They said, like, you know, it was custom exercise. Um, they thought it was cocaine. They didn't realise it was only cigarettes and they want you. <laughs> so so I left it for two weeks. I got myself a barrister and I went down there. And thank God, when you go in to see custom exercise, they um, they give you all the answers to, to your questions. It's not like a police station. I just ask you random shit. Yeah. And you go, no comment. With the custom exercise, they, they lay it all out. They got all the questions. So I just went, no comment, no comment, no comment. Why was you there? I said, I've got a girlfriend over there. I said, she's married. And that's why I'm over there every week. And that was it. You know, I'm not going to give you her, but I'm, I've got no no involvement in this. I never have. And if you've got any proof, nick me. And my mate got six months and that was it. And that was it. That was uh, that was the end of that game what I'd done. And then I, and then I came back and then they was on me again. And they just would not let up. They were going, they were looking in my bins. They were fucking following me. I couldn't earn a pound note. Um, and then I, I, you know, I started doing some, um, doing a Charlie again, you know, just doing that. And um, I, was, I was working with some Colombians and I had four or five guys working with me, you know, that were working for me. Yeah. And, and I'd arrange for them to pick up all the gear. And then, um, then we had 9-11. You know, the, the tower blocks. Yeah, yeah. That went off. And then they all stayed up watching that on the, on the television. And I'd arranged 10K for one of my pals. He had, he had cancelled because all these people had cancelled, but he still wanted 2K. Two, two so um, I, phoned my bo- I phoned everyone. I said, like, is that, take 2K down and drop it off to him, blah, blah, blah. And they said, I've been out all night. I'm pissed. I'm on I'm, I'm this. Because of what happened. I said, oh, don't worry, I'll take it. So when I, when I went down there, I dropped the gear off to him and uh, he's gone into a block of flats and just as he'd gone into the block of flats, five minutes later, all my windows came in on the car and he walked out of the block with two kilos and I was fucked. Oh. So that was the end. And then you know what? Well, that was, that was someone that you knew or was that was a copper that you'd done the two kilos? No, no, it was one of my pals. Oh. You know, it was a guy, a guy I knew and, and uh, 
you know, up until that, that moment, I had all people doing loads of stuff. Yeah. And, I, and I thought, you know, I can't let him down. Cause that's, you know, that's yeah. what, the sort of person I was. Um, and I'd done it myself. And, uh, you know, it was such an innocuous little move. I was just sitting outside there waiting for the money to come down. And the next thing, uh, I saw a, a, two traffic wardens, a postman, and they was all like pincering me. And I thought, fucking the next thing, the windows came flying through. Old Bill came from everywhere. And, I, and then I was laying on the floor and I was thinking, oh, no. And then he walked out of the block. And uh, so, you know, that was it. I was fucked. You know, I don't go in the nick. And that was, uh, I got six years for it. Wow. So, <laughs> so yeah, I was under six years. And, and I was really gutted because they took my ass off me. I had a beautiful ass. Uh, I had a girlfriend. Um, uh, she was called Sunshine Frost. Her sister was Sadie Frost. Oh, right. She yeah. was married to Jude Law. And um, we, had, we had a nice ass up in Endon as well. So I had one down the road here, one in Endon. And, uh, you know, we was just we was on the verge of moving to Spain and just retiring. You know, I had, I had enough money. I had it all sorted out. We'd been over to Spain. I looked at a nice gaff. And there I was. There I was, spread eagle on the floor, thinking, "Fuck, it's finished." You know what I mean? And then, um, yeah. So when I came out, I came out to nothing. They, they confiscated my ass. They confiscated everything. And she'd left me. All my money had gone. Um, and then I had to start fresh. You know, and I was really. How angry. much did they take off you? In total, uh, the houses. Cut a million pounds. Oh. You know what I mean? They took it all. You know, I think one of my flats was worth six hundred fifty thousand. One of the asses was worth a million and a half. I had a few quid in the bank for a hundred thousand quid. I mean, so yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a good time, you know. I just thought I was invincible. I thought I was infallible, you know. We 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 get you get to a point where you just think it's 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 so easy earning money doing what we're doing. You just you just you take shortcuts, you know. I should never have bought an ass. I should never put any money in the bank. But I did because I thought I was fucking invincible. Yeah. And then I lost it all. And then uh, then I came out of prison and I and I was I was bitter. And then I I started. You know, doing the robberies. You know, I got off, I got offered. Uh, I wanted to do something that really wasn't gonna, you know, cause me too much grief. You know, I don't want to carry guns. I don't want to do twenty one years because my pals were doing that and they yeah. were getting shot. Um, I didn't want to, you know, use too much violence. You know, because I'm not really into that. I'm just, I just want money. I don't want to hurt people. That's what I thought. Uh, so I came up with, with a plan with the police uniforms and 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 doing the computer chips and and it and it. And we were, we were so successful that we had other people coming to us and asking us to retrieve stuff for them, you know, um, you know. And we we did. We was we was highly motivated. We were very professional, um, and we we planned everything. We had cars. We'd look at it for two or three weeks, and when we went in, we we had search warrants. We had everything. We we never left anything to chance. We knew when the. Where the local police station was, how the, how the times were, who the neighbours were, you know. And when you go in as old Bill, you know, people just don't give a... F they don't look. Yeah, no, definitely not. You, you know, just automatically yeah. trust straight away. If someone starts screaming, it's just one of those things. Yeah. So, you know, we 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 were... Did you have an insider in the in the police to be able to gain all, like, these police uniforms and the cars and... Do you know what? I think, you know, we... We are well-connected. <laughs> yeah, so with with my pal's army training, so he's good on all the all the seats, you know, the radios and all that. Uh, he's very very good at, at uh, military stuff um, and and looking at places, getting everything we need. Uniforms were not a problem. So what? But you know, there's, there's a certain there's a certain thing when you've got a police uniform on the boots, the the the, tr the trousers, the jeans, or anything, anything you know the the, the, the that pretty fast, everything the vest and you've got the cuffs and everything else and you got you just and you feel the part of the radio's going and you are 100 percent copper and you know and you've got five guys highly motivated the same as you that would not take any bollocks you know we never took no guns we never took no cs gas we never took nothing we used to walk in the gas you know and we just used to have us you know it was, it was about using our voices our intellect and our common sense it was never about hurting any people we embarrassed a lot of people yeah um but it was That's probably would Probably the biggest thing of pissing them all off was the fact that not only did you intim you you impersonated them, you pissed them off too. Yeah. Um, hence why they give you an even extensive sentence, probably than what you what you oh, yeah. would have. Yeah. Mm. I was I was I was I was, uh, I was definitely a trophy. You know, you know, I could imagine like them having a massive piss up when I was nicked. Did you, you know? did you find out exactly the extent of how bad they wanted you, like with 
Like, you know, <laughs> the fact that MI5 was actually there must have been like, what the fuck, we were on MI5's radar. Uh, Did well, you even yeah. believe that you was even on their radar? Or was it the fact that because of the chips were so important that you have an understanding that they could bring in outside, outside like, extended police force? I think, you know, at the time, we never gave it a second thought. You know, we, we, I became aware of it very quickly after my power had been nicked. Um, that um, that the shit had really hit the fan because there was a special squad. They're, they're like an like an SO nine seven four, whatever the, the name they, they used, and uh, and they had seventy of them. And you know, everywhere I went because they, they had facial recognition all around everywhere. Now, everywhere I seemed to go, they, their door would go through. And I kept thinking, how the fuck are these? How are these? And they're getting one step in front of me all the time. And even you know, I'd go to certain places, and five minutes later, my power phone me said, "Tell the old bill just come in the fucking ass." They just come through the door. They, they're obviously on your phone, so I got rid of the phones. You know, I had to change my phone every week anyway, uh -huh. you know. Um, so, you know, they were, they, were, they, were, they were using facial recognition, they were using everything, but they were going for everywhere. They, they, my dad, I spoke to my dad once, he said, he said, the neighbour just been in to us, what's the matter? He said, oh, there's the old bill across the road. He said, they've, they've, they've obviously borrowed one of his rooms to look at me to see if you're coming down here. So <laughs> my mum's place, my, my kids' fucking asses. Uh, they were following my, my, my ex-girlfriend. Um, I can remember her phoning me saying, like, you know, they've... Uh, there's, there's two of them outside. I said, how do you know they're old belts? He said, because he's, he's got fucking brand new trainers on and, and he's got an helmet on carrying a, a bit of wood. You know? yeah. She said he just looks high out of place. And then, you know, when they looked at it, I mean, they realised it was old Bill. There was, there was a little team on them as well. Wow. So, you know, everyone and everything, you know, they'd like, you know there was on everyone. You know, it was, my, they shut me down. They shut down every buyer I had. They shut down every avenue of communication I had with people. And my last, my last, you know, retort was actually trying to get out of the country, which I was actually doing at that time. And, you know, and that's why I was on my way to uh, Luton Airport when I got nicked. Wow. You know, but as I said, it was a massive relief. It was like the whole weight of the world had just been lifted off my shoulders. I actually, you know, I was really calm when I was going back. I actually, even I tried to escape, you know, a few days later. But that, that night, I, I, I was quite relieved. I thought, you know, it's over now. I'll do a few years and I can have my life back. You know, I'll pay my debts to society and it's, and it's back. What do I do then? Um, but, you know, I was, I, you know what? I, I was really fortunate and I got nicked, which is a really strange thing to say. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, because I ended up going, as I said, I went to Grendon. You know, <coughs> Grendon is a very unique place. It has 228 of the worst criminals that you could imagine, from serial killers, everybody you know um and it teaches you so much about yourself you know and things that i took for granted about being in care i normalized mm -hmm. abandonment issues i had insecurities i was so insecure you know i made myself into a monster yeah you know i was i was that afraid of my fucking shadow that i created this persona that i was invincible i'd be the first one in i'd do all the talking and if anyone started i'd be the first one to whack him on the jaw yeah and and inside i was afraid all the time i was scared I was, um, yeah, I was, I was in a fucking really bad place. You know, I was self-medicating, cocaine, heroin. You know, doing crack. Um, I went for a really bad fucking year where I just was just, just, just sort of went in, into myself. And then I had a mental sort of breakdown in myself. And then came to the conclusion that the drugs I was taking was actually instead of making me find out who I was, was actually fucking destroying me. It was a year. It took me a whole year to realise it. You know, was, this, was this the realisation that, that took in place where it made you just change everything about you and to stop <laughs> doing um, the things you do now? Or, or yeah, was it? Uh, well, you know, Grendon for me was, was, was a, definitely part of the medicine, part of the cure. It's not the medicine that cures everyone. Um, but I learned a lot about, about tolerance, about boredom. I learned that shame and embarrassment doesn't physically hurt. Um, you know, once you deal with it, you become a very strong person. Mm -hmm. You know, I was really, I was really one of these people that if you if you annoyed me, I'd whack you. If you had a conversation with me, I'd whack you. So I, I never had no, I couldn't articulate an argument. It was either fight or flight all the time. Yeah. And the good thing about that, I was, I was, I was really in a really, really bad place in this in this gap. You know, I've, I can remember talking to a guy. They just come on the wing, and um, he, 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 he said that. Um, he said that his daughter wanted to die. So I was, I was actually taken aback by it. And I said, well, what, what do you mean she wanted to die? And he said, um, 
He said, what happened? I, was, I had separated from my wife. We were going for a divorce and I was staying at her place until I found another gaff. And then I decided to kill myself one night. And I had two doors, one six and one nine. And, uh, and I'd gone down in the kitchen. She was asleep. And then I got a bottle of whiskey and some pills. And um, I, I had a drink and had a pill. And about, you know, half one, two o'clock, my daughter came down. And he said I was crying and all that. And he, and he, and he, and he said that she said, Daddy, well, Daddy what's, the, what's, the, what's the matter? He said, I'm going to heaven. You know, I want to go to heaven. I'm going to heaven. And she said, can I come? Wow. You know, and he went, he went, yeah. You know, so he started playing a little game with her where he'd give her a little drink of water and a pill. And then when she passed out, she wasn't dead. So what he did, he went and got a, black, uh, a plastic carrier bag outside the k- kitchen uh, in the kitchen drawers and put it over her head. Cause it, and then she, he said, then she started screaming, like and scratching him and he's fucking everything else. And then she died. And then uh, the other daughter came down and uh, she saw what happened to her daughter and she started screaming. And woke the mother up. The mother came down and saw what happened. And she ran with the other daughter out, out the front door. And then he was trying to justify in front of me what and she asked him. She asked him to, you know, to go to heaven with him. And as much as I wanted to kill this geezer, sorry. No, I'm feeling it as well, mate. I'm feeling it as well. I was about to turn around and say yeah. it is, it's okay, it's okay, but I couldn't, I couldn't get the words out. Like. I think, you know, as much as, as much as I really want to hurt him, because I've got kids at home, and I, you know. I was in a place where I couldn't use violence. My biggest stock in trade was violence forever. And um, so I had to sit there and deal with it. And it was the first time I've ever, ever been in a position where I've just had to sit there and not do nothing. And so, so, and I found myself being in these positions in that therapy quite a few times with people that have killed kids. One guy killed his... Um, his um his girlfriend's son, they had two sons and he, he split his um and um spleen and uh he said, you know, I was having a conversation with him, he said, I can always remember the look between me and that kid as if the kid was saying to me, Daddy, what have you done? He was his stepdad. But he used to torture the kids when the when the girlfriend used to go out because because that was his way of getting back because he couldn't do it with her. And you know, so you know, so you sat and then you had another atrocity you know, you know, I can remember talking to a year a young kid who's about nineteen years old and I asked him what he was in for and um he said his 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 girlfriend had gone out and he was looking after the baby and the baby's only six months old and um she started crying and he couldn't get he couldn't get to stop so he pushed her legs right open down her back and then he punched her and punched her. She had about eighty bruises. We found out, you know. And then I'm sitting in front of him thinking, Fuck it you know, so 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 where I was this guy that was really, you know, always quick to violence, I would have killed him if I would have been in any other prison. But I had to sit with it. So really what he taught me was, was, was tolerance, which was my biggest thing. I could never, you know, tolerance was my biggest thing. And also conflict resolution was my worst thing as well. You know, so I would constantly have battles with these people mm-hmm. and I'd want to kill them. So first of all, I'd use their offense against them, you fucking piece of shit. You know, you rapist, you fucking child killer, everything else. But then I'd get, I'd get winged by the other, the other staff and, and my, my peers, you know, the guys that were doing therapy, because you can't use their offense against them. You have to use articulation. So after a repetition of going through this month after month after month, I then became, I then got myself into a place where, where I wanted to kill them and smash them and do all sorts of shit and use their offense against them. I then had to take stock of that, the situation, and say, like, if you keep doing the same thing, then you're going to get the same results. So now you need to articulate. So... I learned this weapon. I learned a new, I had a new power that I can actually just talk and articulate. So I could tell him exactly what I wanted to tell him about the violence and all the animosity. And it felt so good that I could release myself without actually getting myself in trouble. So for the first time in my life, I, I had acquired articulation to all these situations. So, which then set me up as I went through the prison sentence, mm-hmm. because now instead of screaming and shouting and using profanity, because when you swear at someone, if I called you a cunt, uh, the first thing you're going to do is try and whack me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you then elicit a response that, that is going to be detrimental to you. So what you do, you, instead of swearing at him and calling him names, you start telling me exactly how you make me feel. This is what you do to me and how you make me feel. By telling me about your child and blah, 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 this is how you make me feel because I can't understand that. 
And then you, so you start operating at a completely different level. And I couldn't have a conversation for more than two minutes with someone normally because it yeah. was all about crime. You know, and the good thing about Grendon is that you couldn't talk about crime. You know, it was all about it was all it yourself. was all about finding you. You know, so you know, over over that two and a half year period, I I learned a really great deal about myself, um, about all my insecurities, about all my abandonment issues, and but the biggest one I learned was about criminality. You know, I had a real hard criminal code that I respected criminals. I respected the crime. I respected the way of life, everything. And and uh, this guy came to me one day and said, um. Terry Liss, I went, yeah. He said, I know so-and-so. And I went, yeah, all right. And I, I didn't know him. But we have a thing, you know, in prison. If someone looks like you, talks to you, you know someone you know, comes from the same area, you invite them in. Yeah. You know, which, which I never do now. Um, but he was talking how great my power was. And I said, why, why, is he, why is he so great? He said, well, when I got out of prison last time, he said, I was only out a couple of days. He came to me and offered me a bit of work. I need 30 grand. And I said, before you say anything else, let me tell you what happened. I bet he offered you yeah, 30 grand for that bit of work, yeah, that he couldn't do it himself because he knew the people, knew the area, and everything else, but he would drive for you. And he, and he went, yeah. I said, that's not your friend, that's a parasite. If he was your friend, he would have given you some fucking money. He'd let you go into your family, not, not put you on a bit of work. So as I, as I sort of saw the mentality and then the reinforcement, I sort of, sort of outgrew it all. You yeah, know, yeah. I, you know, you start seeing it for what it was. Yeah, and it, you know, I I never wanted to change. I never wanted Grin to work, but it did. Yeah, because I then, because once all the anger went, you know, I used to, I used to drink, smoke, womanize everything. I used to be the worst one. I could I could go out on the benders for weeks. I'd go with a different woman, three three different women every single day, and I had loads of girlfriends and everything else. Uh, and I had loads of money. I wasn't. I never got girlfriends because I was good looking. I got, I got girlfriends because I had money and Charlie and everything mm. else. Um, you don't see that then, no, do you? No, you don't see that. It's only now when you you start working through like the layers of why yeah. you know people you know respect you or they like you. It's all because of you know, the respect is there through fear. The like is there through the need of wanting what they can get for free. You know, it's not until you accept <coughs> yourself that you start opening your eyes up to the darkness that you accepted as the light at that yeah. time. It's all false. You know, it, you know, for me, it was just, you know, getting away from it now is, uh, yeah, it's really changed, it changed me. You know, I've, I've, I feel, I feel like I've, I've put that life aside now. You know, I feel, I feel, I feel blessed. You know, I wake up every single day and I feel blessed. You know, I've got my two dogs and my girlfriend. Yeah, um, who's lovely? Yeah, your dogs are crazy. One of them is, <laughs> but, but you know, normally, you know, you, you know, I take my dogs. Uh, you know, one is a pomeranian. You yeah, know, and I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm six foot, yeah. and I've got a little pomeranian and a little <laughs> little cabin poo in, in the middle of Hampstead. You know, and I speak quite posh. Nah. Um, yeah, it's you know, it's a transformation. My girlfriend is, is a teaching assistant. She works in the school. Yeah, amazing. Um, yeah, and um, and I've and I've I've started working for the first time in my life. Amazing. Yeah. So, um, as I said, you know, I went, I went for a few job interviews when I left prison because of my, uh, um, criminality or my, is it criminal vitara, you know, as they, as they call it. Um, I was able to get a job, you know, I was able, unable to get any, any accommodation. And, you know, once they knew I had a criminal, I couldn't even rent a place out. Um, I was fortunate enough that someone offered me a, a room, you know, so I, I took it. I stayed there for a few months and then I met, I met Anna. Um, uh, yeah, and then uh, we, we, uh, my, my daughter and her boyfriend were, were, were doing a thing called Scoff Mills. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they're making nutritious milks. You know, Robin, uh, her boyfriend, is a real good chef. He's, he's one of the best chefs. I've seen yeah. the pictures. There's the food, you can put a picture frame around yeah. it. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, and, and this, is, this is food that you can order and have it delivered, you know, and you, you could put a, a picture frame around yeah yeah we you know what we started we started he started in the kitchen when i first met him and and then we then moved to uh, uh another shared kitchen uh and then we moved to hackney uh another shared kitchen uh and we just outgrew that and you know what it was really good because as a criminal i worked 24 hours a day you know i never switched off i was always thinking about crime and to use that that now on on something straight and actually get the rewards mm -hmm. <coughs> and see it grow. So we've gone from a little kitchen to a shared kitchen uh, to we got our own kitchen, which is I think about sixteen uh, sixteen hundred square feet that was. And now we just moved into a new premises for the last seven months uh, with four thousand square feet, and wow. we employ ten people. 
Um, and we've just seen that company grow and grow through sheer determination and hard work. You know, I, I, I come in here sometimes and I, I can barely walk. My back's killing me. Uh, my feet have, 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 have gone to a different planet. You know? Rewarding though, isn't it? But you know what? I wake up every single morning and I wake up at two o'clock in the morning and go to work sometimes and just yeah. to get, get forward. And, and my girlfriend, no matter what time I get up, she makes me a cup of coffee and oh, man, breakfast. That's amazing. It doesn't matter what time it is, so it's, it's really. But to have someone like her, because I wouldn't be able to do this about her. You know, when I say that Grendon was part of the part of it, you know, there's there's all there's all there's been parts of everything that have come together as one. Because I don't think there's there's no such thing as rehabilitation. Um, I think there's a perception of change, and I think some people fake it to make it. But I also believe that if everything comes together at a certain time, um, I started getting involved. Uh, in knife crime because um, two of the kids died across the road uh, in my girlfriend's school. They got stabbed six months apart and a couple of kids got stabbed down the, down the road in Queen's Crescent. My, my niece's girlfriend got stabbed and killed. And, and so, you know, I started doing that. I started working for Scoff. I then went to church. You know, I was a born-again Christian. And I put myself in a position where I couldn't fail. I couldn't fail these people, mm -hmm. you know. So... I never started off to change. I was just in a position where I was talking about knife crime. I was trying to tell the community they shouldn't protect these scum uh, that, 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 that stab kids and kill them. Mm -hmm. you know, they're not criminals. They're not even, they're nothing. You know, they're worse than pedophiles. They're worse yeah. than rapists because they've taken out a young kid's life. That's, you know, but people defend these fucking idiots and they, and they, and they protect them in their communities where well, they shouldn't. So, so I stand up and say in my community, I'm a, I'm a known criminal. I was a criminal. And I don't care if someone calls me a grass or a snitch or whatever. If you stab a kid, I will put you in. That's it. Yeah. You know, because you know what, you're you're pretty do more good going into prison and learning from that fucking mistake than than teaching someone else that because you're on the run, it's okay, you know, and they're looking up to you. But I started doing that. And as I said, you know, I got into into a situation where I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't let people down. I started doing talks in schools. Mm -hmm. And and I, I went to the units, you know, the worst where the worst kids were. Yeah. And uh, I suffer from dyslexia. You know, believe it or not, even though I wrote I wrote like those you've ten got, books now. You've got ten books. Um, yeah. I'll show you them in a minute. But I, I got dyslexia, and I can always remember going into, into the unit. And these kids are very, very, they're very tough. They have got a lot of bravado, and they're very in your face, you know. And I let them speak and everything else for a few minutes, and then I explained to them about prison. About the dangers, you know, coming out yourself three times a day. You know, when you go to the, the gym, you're you're going to get attacked if you owe money, if you owe anything. When you go to your breakfast, dinner, and tea, you know, and then you got to go and exercise. These are the danger points. But also, there's a real there's a nighttime economy inside prison. There's the screaming, there's the music, there's the shouting, there's the bells going off when people are committing suicide. Yeah, and there's a the smell. You know, and people don't really talk about the smell of prison. No, they don't. It fucking reeks. You know, you got people smoking gearing their cells, you've got people shitting, you know, and most of the, most of the prisons now, you have to share, you have to share on remand, you have to share, so you need, you now have to go into a cell where you've got someone defecating in front of you three times a day, going to piss four or five times a day, you've got their tooth decay, their BO, their socks, everything, you know, and they're smoking in the cell, and you've got to put up with that, so there's nowhere to go, and you're, you're in that environment 24 hours a day, it's good that you yeah. spout that message, mate, because, um, you know, you never really hear about all of that stuff. You know, when these guys are walking around in their thousand pound trainers and 500 pound jeans and that lot, they're not thinking of all of that stuff. <coughs> There's not enough awareness being made with it all. That's what we try and do with, as you know, that I've got a knife crime charity. You know, we try and raise the awareness on that front that, you know, you might be class yourself as a family out on the streets, but when you go to jail, you're on your own. Yeah, you know, as a, you know, I, I, I was away, you know, people have phones and everything else, yeah. You know, you're being like 24 hours a day. You're out, you're coming out for association for an hour, yeah, if you're lucky. And then you do these little videos where you're like, look at me, I've got, I got the suntan lotion there, I've got some fucking, I've got my new trainers here, I've got my PlayStation and everything else. That life is good, you know, and we put it out on social media. But, you know, it's all bollocks yeah. because, you know, for 24 hours or the other 23 hours, you're sitting there, you know, and you're bored shitless. You know, your family have moved on. You know, when you do a life sentence, you know, um, you know, the first four or five years, you know, go really quick, you know, because it's all new. You know, you make new friends, you know, you're going to education, you're doing all these little things, you know. Then all of a sudden, 
everyone starts moving on again. You're still there. Yeah. Then you've got to do another six years. And that six years gets really long. You get to the point where, where you just get panic attacks. You, you, you start thinking, is this how we're going to fucking end? You mm. know? And then family members die. People get married. All your friends that said they were going to look after you have got jobs and they've all fucking changed. So yeah. that bravado and that, that brothership has all disappeared. You know, the thing that I killed someone for and done all this for, they've all moved on. They learned, they learned from me coming in here. Yeah. And they said they was going to look after me forever. They've all moved on. No one's sending me no fucking money. And all of a sudden, you, you know, you, you do that next six years and then you've got to start the next six years. And then you're going through the parole board. You've got to do all these courses. And then you're going to, you, you do everything. You, you know, you, you're, you, you do the courses. You don't get in no trouble. You ain't had a fight for fucking six years. And then you go and they say, well, you know, you, you have to do another six years. You know, so now you're doing you're you're, you're looking at the twenty four year stretch of stabbing stabbing something yeah. there, and you know, and then all of a sudden you're seeing yourself looking older, looking thinner. Your hair goes, you're you're, you're anemic. You know, you might go to the gym, but your 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 eyes are fucking gone. They're dead. Yeah, yeah. You know, because you have to, when you take someone's life, you die inside. I know every every guy I met who killed someone is a part of their soul that dies, and as much as they they use that. That bravado, you know, like, you know, because because they use it as a, a barrier on some of them, you know, but they also use it to push other people away because they're scared, you know. So what they say, yeah, I fucking stabbed him, and they go through the motions, and they they'll be animated and everything else, and they use that to push you away because yeah. once you once they start speaking, you let them in, or they, you know, you realise that they're fucking weak, you know, they they got so many insecurities, and then you ask, them, I just, I just say to guys, you know, what, why do you carry a fucking knife for? And they say because I didn't want to get hurt. You know, I, I feared getting punched in the face or getting hurt, and you know, through my embarrassment, being embarrassed, my ego being fucked, and I realised that, that all the stuff I learned in 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 Grindon was really the stuff that, that that perpetuates people to kill. You know, the the biggest strong motivating factor for people to kill is ego, embarrassment, shame. If someone shames you, you're going to stab them. Embarrass you, you're going to stab them. Yeah. They fuck with your ego, they're going to stab you. You know, and bravado, all these things, and you know, so that's why I wrote a book. It's it's a it's about early intervention. It's going to come out next year. You know, I've really already we're just editing it now. But it's about early intervention. But everything I learned through through Grendon about you know um, tolerance, ego, and everything else, and I put that all into a book. I'm hoping that you know I'm going to give it out free anyway because I'm going to I'm going to, I'm going to get it printed and it's going to be for nothing. We're going to yeah. give it to the knife crime just to, to empower because it is all about early intervention. Knife crime is about early intervention. We're not going to solve this. We we, we can talk until we're blue in the face. We can open. We can open, you know, playgrounds, everything else. But the kids that go to the stab people don't go to the fucking playground. They don't go to the youth centres. You know, the the good kids go to the play centres. The good kids go to the youth centres and everything else and do the apprentices. But there was a there was a there was a part of society that that, that is dark. Yeah, you know, they 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 come from you know single parent families. They have got no money. They think they're doing really good. They get themselves into a the position where they have to protect that. You know, and then when you start protecting your position at any cost, then you have to start hurting people. Yeah. You know, but but how we justify it? We think, well, I'm giving my mum some money. I'm looking after my boys. You know, I'm using. I'm like Robin Hood. I'm I'm getting this money, but I'm giving it all that. So I have to protect it. So we convince ourselves in our heads that what we're doing, we're hurting people, is for the greater good. You can't change that mindset. You can never change that mindset, no matter how much, how many police you get on. You can't arrest your way out of this. You can't. You can't say nothing to these guys. You can't even imprint your hindsight. Mm. You may change one or two. They may they may walk away. Brilliant. That's great. But my my thing is really we need to start on the sixteen year or twenty year plan straight from from junior school, primary school, secondary school, and further education. That's just you know the, the thing I learned most about growing up was about conflict resolution. You know, whenever I used to get into a conflict. I used to have a fight. I, used, you know, I'd have a fight. I'd punch you and everything else. And afterwards, I'd think, "Fucking, I wish I'd never done that." Now, I wish I never hurt him. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. And you know, and I'd tell myself, and I convince myself that next time it happens, I won't do that. Yeah. But it'd be such a long time before it happened again. I'd revert back to the same thing. Yeah. I'd bam, 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 and, and I'd be out of it. And I'd think, "Oh, fuck, I've done it again." And you go through life, you never change. But the thing with conflict resolution, when you learn it and you get put in that position all the time, you you start to understand your body and how your adrenaline rush and how the hotness and everything reacts, and then you realise that that doesn't control you no more. Mm. You then control it by by articulation, and that's what I think we should be teaching in schools. We should be teaching conflict resolution, anger management, all these things that are really going to set these guys up to succeed, you know, instead of fail. Because you know, it, academically, they're really good. 
you know, they're really intelligent. They write songs. They do poetry. They do tattoos. They, you know, they're very, yeah. they're very, you know, most of them are really well educated. But the moment they come to some sort of conflict resolution, they're just formed to bits. They want to get their friends involved. They want to do this. Mm -hmm. They don't think of the actions and the consequences yeah. of, of what yeah. is going to happen to the, the parents' families, to their families. That was the one thing that I put forward was um, the long-lasting damage that happens to not just me as a brother, but to, um, you know, my mum, you know, their parents, you know, like how, how it weren't just us that was affected. Yeah. We didn't just lose someone that day through knife crime. They also did, you know, and it, it does, the, the, the effect is counterproductive because you you might get yourself known as a, as a killer. You might re-nickname yourself killer, you know, which is one of the people did that who, who took my brother's life. But you have damaged so much, so much. And it would go down in generations. Yeah. My brother, he had kids. His kids were having kids who so had grandchildren. This is a long-lasting effect that is, is going to carry on. Like, And you don't think about that when you're carrying the knife. You know, and also we... we... You know, I, I see it from when I just, because I talk to lots of mothers and all that. And, you know, they come to me and they say, you know, my son's smoking, drinking and all that, swearing. And they got a cigarette in their mouth and some of them have got joints. Yeah. And I tell them, you know, look, unless you actually lead by example and stop drinking, stop smoking and stop swearing, stop smoking gear, then how do you expect them to do that? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so, you know, it's really up to, it's a, it's a parent's thing as well. The one thing we don't get, I know I, I've got, I've got, you know, it's quite a few kids. <laughs> and too many so I can even mention. But um, you know, I never I never I thought I was a good dad. My girlfriend thought she was a good mum. You know, but we never get lessons of me and a mum. We just we just we just do what we think yeah, is, yeah. is a so you know it's is about good parenting. It's about teaching people to be good parents. It's about you know, it's about being a good role model. You know, we've got role models now that they're villains. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, people want to aspire to being a fucking you know, someone that kills someone, someone that robs. You know, people come to me and say, you know, I, I really want to be like, and I say, hold up, whoa, whoa. You want a spider to do in 20 or 30 years in prison? You fucking run it Yeah, a guy I spoke to yeah. the other day, Liam Ditchie, he's, um, he called me up and he turned around and said something. He said, um, people are so quick to do a 25 for a friend that won't be there for him yeah. and too afraid to do a nine to five for their family and children. <laughs> do you know, it's, you know, as I, you know, you know what being dyslexic's like. Mm -hmm. I know that, that what drove me, I, I remember going over to the school, as I said, you know, doing, doing the talks over there. And I can remember, because I wrote loads of books, and I, and I, and I said to, to them, before I start, I'm going to tell you something, I'm actually dyslexic. And is, is there anyone here dyslexic? And there was, there was two kids, they went, you know, they, they went, I am. And, they, and, and the teacher told me afterwards that he'd never, ever admitted that. Wow. He'd never said anything. And the other kids said, I'm as well. And, I, and I, so I said, you know, so... I know what I know what drove me. You know, being dyslexic made me confrontational, argumentative, and very destructive. And I used to I used to exclude myself from classes, not because I didn't want to do it, because I felt embarrassed. I felt embarrassed in front of my peers that I couldn't I couldn't spell, I couldn't fucking read right. Yeah. So what I did, I then I then went and and found something I could excel at was criminality, where no one could judge me. Yeah. So you know, so so knowing what I know about the way I went, you know, I think it's really important that if kids have got dyslexia, they need to be, they need to first own it. They need to be encouraged to own it. Yeah. And they need to, to let all their friends know because if your friends know you're dyslexic and they don't take the piss at you, then they're not your friends. If your teacher knows you're dyslexic and she doesn't treat you right or he doesn't treat you, the, the, the symptom, then they shouldn't be fucking teaching. Yeah. yeah. So we need to, we need to, Instead of excluding kids for being disruptive, we need to go older. I mean, why is this kid being disruptive? What's the reasons? There's obviously, there's obviously, it's, it's so simple because I spoke to lots of guys, and you know what? It's something happening at home with the parents. Now get to the root cause of it. Yeah. It's, you know, a lot of the kids, I, a lot of the criminals I met were dyslexic. You know, I'm talking a massive majority of them are, are dyslexic. But I also met a lot of guys in prison that were very well, well educated, they had all the advantages in life. And still became criminal. So, yeah. so it isn't just a dysfunctional family. It isn't just about education. There's so many different factors that we need to to come together and actually learn from 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 therapy, from actually talking to people. It's only by talking we can actually understand these guys. But the first thing is we need to treat dyslexia. We need to treat. Uh, we need to stop excluding kids. Yeah. We need to find a way of educating these kids because they may not be good academically, but I know from my own personal experience I was really good at doing other things. So we need to channel that. that that side of them into doing something really positive because that will change their life. If they get channeled in the right direction, 
They will have a prosperous, productive life. Don't hurt anyone. Don't go to prison and don't cost society a fortune. Or we leave them to fucking rot. Mm. And we just think, well, they're going to get all right if we just leave them. But they're not. They're going to they're spiral out of control, end up killing someone, doing drugs, taking drugs. And for every time they break into someone's ass, they're causing misery. Yeah, really. You know, and, and they're nicking off their own parents. And everything. So, it's, it's, you know, we really need to start treating the cause instead of the after effect. The after effect is, is put them in prison. We always do it after they've done something wrong. You know, you know it yourself. Yeah. So we, if we, you know, so for me, I wrote um, a, an early intervention book. I hope to have it out next year. Um, so hopefully, the, the lessons that they can learn, or the lessons I learned in Grendon, and I think they're quite powerful lessons, because you know, once you read something, you're more inclined to actually learn from that. If I told you something, you're not necessarily going to take that on because that's my hindsight. Yeah. But if you read something and you think, you know what, that's our own, because most of the people that have actually read Living Amongst the Beasts have all said, that's how I think. That's how I react. That's how I do this. And now I need to look at myself and the way I respond to people. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a bestseller that I've sold it in, you know, all around the world. And I get people. Is this one is on Yeah. I get people all, all around saying it empowered me to talk about my abuse. Talk about me to talk about my childhood because I, you know, I talk about my childhood um, and how it affected my life. You know, if I never came from such a dysfunctional family in the beginning, and I and I had someone to correct my uh, my dyslexia, my life would have been so much different. Yeah, you know, I've destroyed so many fucking lives because I was allowed to slip under the net mm -hmm. because it was thought that it was best to exclude me from school, put me in a home, and treat me like a dog. You know, um, and I, I own all my decisions. You know, I don't blame anybody. You know, I, I can see that in you. You've definitely accepted where you've gone wrong. You own, you've owned your um, decisions that you've made, and you've come to terms with it. Yeah. And that's um, that's absolutely probably one of the biggest steps in your life that you could have done to be able to stay in on the path that you're on now, writing all these books. You're doing a lot in your community to help your 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 girlfriend. She is a teacher at a local school, literally just opposite. And you guys really do do a lot. I mean, the we money that you up, make yeah. from your books, you put back into getting more books to give away, don't you? I just I've just done this one. I've done, I've done these two, yeah. Um, the doodles. I, I I actually asked two separate girls. One was Molly. Um, one was Scarlett. And I thought if I ask this one to draw me some pictures because it's quite time consuming because yeah. they're really very, very professional. Um, but they've done such a good job that I actually use both their pictures in two different books. Same story, two different books. Nice. But the, the dedications I did, um, I don't think you can see this, but I dedicated it to, to the school teacher. Um, and all the, all, I made all the kids in this, it's all kids, kids. I made them characters throughout the book, you know, because it's about, it's about Rudy, my dog here, and yeah, about yeah. my mate's dog, Archie. It's about an adventure over Hampstead, but you know, and you know, I've sold, I've sold like a couple hundred books now. Like we only released it a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I'm a proud but, owner of one of them. Yeah, yeah. But the best, the best, the, the most. It was a good thing um, writing it. I loved it because I love, I love doing things now. It's quite creative as I got older. But the most enjoyment I get is when I go around to schools, I go to the hospital wards, and I go here some books, and they say how much, and I say no, this is free. These are, these are dedicated for the people of Camden Town and everybody that have bought this book. It's a dedication from me to say thank you for all the work you did through the, the COVID period, mm -hmm. the, the epidemic. And, and, and you know what? Seeing some of the looks on their faces, it, it, it really touches me. You know? Yeah. Because I saw Anika at work every day, you know, and, and this is when it first started when people were dying. And, and I, was, I, was, I was so um, inspired uh, by the fact that she went to work every day knowing that, that she probably you know, might catch it. Mm hmm you know, so 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 I wrote that, and and I, and I managed to write another five books over the COVID period. I wrote, I wrote Living Amongst the Beasts. I wrote Verizon, The Final Countdown, HMP, and I've just finished another five, which are being edited now. So, dyslexia just goes to show she does not stop you from being able to write all of these books, and they're 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 becoming big, aren't they? You've, uh... yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing quite a few podcasts, but you know, the, the amazing thing is, is as much as we, we suffer from dyslexia, you know, we've got modern technology now, you know, all my, all my books are written on, on this phone. I've got notes on here and you know, you've got, you've got predictive sex. Yeah. And I write on notes and you know what, just having that little predictive text and just to help you along, you know, and actually be able to write the words that you want. Cause you know, when you write and you've got dyslexia, you're not very good at spelling. 
you end up writing letters and, and you use words that are really easy to spell and you look you, you don't look as intelligent or you don't want to yeah. you don't convey the message that you want the beauty about having good technology now and being able to write the things that are in your head and being able to put them onto paper at the, at the touch of a phone but is 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 this opened up my whole life yeah yeah you know and and, and i tell people and i and we started up a thing called uh, uh austin and ellis media so what I'm doing now, you know, because it costs between three and a half and five thousand pounds to write a book. So what I'm doing, I've got, I've got, I've already signed up four people. We've do, we're doing their books now. Um, I'm giving them guys an opportunity for for, for a thousand pound a book. So we put it on. We we do the editing. We do everything. Uh, the synopsis, the forward, the cover, uh, the proofread, everything. We make sure everything's proper and we get it out there. And all the money that's, that's, that that comes goes straight into their accounts. Because I want to give people an opportunity to get their stories out. Because I feel that there are so many people coming out of prison. There are so many people that have been abused. There's so many people that have had real good, you know, life experiences that they can't, they can't get out of there because they can't fucking afford it. Mm, yeah. Because, because there's so many, so many people out there just want to take advantage of them. So I'm because I know how fulfilling it felt for me to actually get my books out. I've created this. And we're doing it at a fraction of the price because that money that we're charging covers our costs. That's it. Yeah, absolutely amazing. You know, and we we do we do. I'm getting people phone me all the time. We're doing their books. Yeah, I wish there was more people that gave the opportunities that you're giving to your community and extended communities as well. It's absolutely amazing. You've come a long way on your on your journey. Um, your life has definitely been um, eventful. Definitely, uh, it's been an absolute like pleasure that you. I mean, when I reached out to you. Yeah. You reached back to me straight away. We had some some lengthy conversations talking about bits and pieces, and uh, it's a real privilege to know you, mate. This is it's reciprocated, yeah. time, brother. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I, I hope, like with the knife crime stuff and that, we could do some more stuff together. It'd be absolutely <laughs> amazing. I think we, you know, we 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 we're doing change your life. We put down your knife, change your life. Mm-hmm. Um, I've just got in touch with Ben up in uh, Coventry. Yeah, Ben Span. Um, ben Span. Yeah. Uh, we just started up a company called Let's Sanify up in yeah. Birmingham. Yeah. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to. I'm putting Ben with um, with uh, Jag, who owns the company. Um, instead of getting money out of this, what the deal I done by helping them set this company up was the fact that I could get ex offenders yeah. leaving prison and giving them an opportunity to do manufacturing courses. Mm-hmm. You know, when I when I first came out of prison, I left with a tent. And I and I and I left with a lot of animosity and a lot of resentment to the fact that the prison sets you up to fail, not to succeed. Yeah. So my 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 driving force is even it is money. I'm not going to lie. There's money, but my biggest driving force is the fact that I can actually help people get to where I am by giving mm. them an opportunity to actually succeed instead of failing. Yeah. So a manufacturing course and and an offer of a job afterwards would be brilliant. Also, the opportunity to write their own books to get their stories out. Because once they start once they start feeling that bit of self worth. Uh, about what they've got to say is, is actually people want to read. They start doing podcasts and yeah. they get the scene. And that's when the medicine starts to work. Yeah, really. Because they start to talk, they start to express themselves, and they and then they they have no other option apart from to go down that right road. Yeah. So it's about putting them on that road. And I, and I Because you start that feeling of feeling good, mm. you know, putting out to the universe positive karma, and you would definitely, if you manifest it correctly, will get that exact same, same karma back. It's absolutely perfect. You know, absolutely amazing that you've um, joined forces with a good friend of mine as well, Ben. It's um, absolutely, uh, it's, it's, it's good stuff. We've got a venture on for a celebrity boxing match next year. So, I'm looking forward um, to it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that'd yeah. be good. That'd be absolutely good. And, uh, yeah, I'm jumping on board with Ben on a lot of things and the same. I'll, I'll come jump on it with you. We're, we're only down the road from you, so if you need any, I'm looking forward to any it. extra voices down here at the school or anything, I'm happy <coughs> Now come to me and let me do the rest. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I look forward to. It. I'm really looking forward to this year. You know, every, you know, every day that I'm out of, out of prison and every day that I'm breathing is a, is a blessing. You know, being just being surrounded by really nice people instead of uh, in a in a den of a necrotic prison is is a, is another day I feel blessed. Yeah. So you know, it's, it's it's been five years since I've been out of prison, and I just feel like you know, there's so much more that I can achieve. You know, I, and I still kick myself of how many years I wasted inside prison. Yeah, but it, you know, saying that it did change my life. Yeah, I've never done Grendon. I've never started reading and writing and educating myself. You know, boredom made me educate myself. Yeah. So sometimes you have to go. Almost into like the, that know. was your purpose in life was to to be to be at your top, to go to your very bottom, to be able to come out and and hopefully 
the message gets out there to younger people so we can we can get there younger and younger every time with a positive message and make them realize earlier the better it is getting better yeah you know it was it is getting better you know it, it always gets worse before it gets better you know it will it will it will run a cycle and, you know, as you, as we, we spoke earlier, you know, there used to be quite a lot of trouble around here, a lot of gangs. You know, I've, unfortunately, most of them are, are in prison now because of, they've, they've stabbed people and killed people. Yeah. The other half, unfortunately, have, have been stabbed. Um, and, you know, you know, it's, it's gradually, you know, they're gradually learning. If they do this, they're going to go in prison. Yeah. If they kill someone, you, you can't put their life back. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is, it is getting a little bit better. But saying that, you know... I thought I thought one weekend when we done a fate down there, we we had like thousands of people come to a fate. It was one of the best weekends, you know, with all the knife crime people uh, coming against violence. Change your life, put down your knife. We had all the cancel there, face painters. We had the circus there. We had all the, you know, the band of brothers. We had everybody down. There was thousands of people, and that oh, same week, yeah. That, eh? But that same same weekend, we had we had a young girl got stabbed, killed. <sighs> We had one guy who got mistaken identity, he got shot, and we had another guy who basically got decapitated down Camden Town. So what turned into one, you know, one of the best weekends actually turned into one of the worst. So you know, as you think it's getting better, it gets worse. Yeah, but you know, it, it will get better. And yeah, just keep pushing for that positive yeah. message, mate, and uh, hopefully we'll get people. Yeah, on I the think same pe- people like you, people like Ben. You know, the one thing I've, I've I'm learning as I've gone through this journey over the last five years is that there are more of us. Yeah. There are more good people than bad people. Yeah, 100%. You know, and I meet so many good kids. You know, I meet kids that, that help out. They, they, you know, they work in food banks. They, they, they dig gardens for people. They paint old people's houses. You know, uh, they're doing lots of apprenticeship. And I see these kids all the time. And, I, and it really, really is, it bugs me to death that, that – on all these media programs, we we are always talking about the bad kids. We really should be putting these other kids to the forefront and saying, "Look, this is what you could be like," because this is what's really happening. Mm-hmm. There are some really good kids in this community. Yeah, yeah, They're doing some great things. Yeah, definitely. And we should we should champion them as well. Hundred percent. Instead of looking at all the bad that's happening in our community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree with you on that one, mate. What a um, what a podcast. So we hope it. Uh... Yeah, I hope it uh, hits the spot. Oh, mate! Oh, listen, that's going to reach out. You, the message is positive, and that's what I love. You know, yeah. um, you know, I love the journey. I love, I love the outcome. I love the fact that you're still hungry to do good, and um, I just appreciate you so much for helping me get that message out there. Without people like yourself, mate, who's who's been through the mill, this message is impossible. You know, so thanks for your time, especially on a Sunday. I really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me into your home. Um, thanks for letting us meet your celebrity dog <laughs> and uh, yeah your story will go on and echo through through these youngsters minds um, does. thank you so much is there anything you'd uh, like to add um, or anything do you know what I just you know there's more to come you know we're, we're gonna we're gonna keep pushing forward keep pushing forward a message you know but it's, it's really about taking responsibility for yourself 100%. you are you are you know you're a you are what you yourself, think yeah. yeah you are what you think you know yeah. if you can change your thought process and start thinking completely different you know, then you will change. All about know? manifestation. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Again, <laughs> thank you so much. Really <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you.